After repeatedly asking the US for a few of their MGM-140 Army Tactical Missile Systems, ATAC-Ms for short, Ukrainian forces will finally be getting this long-awaited upgrade to their arsenal. In September, military officials in Washington confirmed they will be sending as many ATAC-Ms over the coming weeks as the US could reasonably spare. And as of mid-October, these high-tech surface-to-surface artillery weapons have been making an impact. But how? In what way? Why are these missiles so crucial for Ukraine compared to other weapons? Let's find out. While offering a special thanks to his friends at the White House recently, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky added that the missiles have more than proven themselves during a pair of synchronized nighttime attacks. Zelensky said that the ATAC-Ms were used against two military airfields, one in Berdyansk and the other in the Luhansk region, a dual strike that resulted in significant losses on the Russian side, including nine military helicopters, an anti-aircraft missile battery, and an ammunition storage depot. Bolstered by their recent upgrade from Washington, Ukrainian officials have stated plainly that with these new weapons at hand, there will be nowhere left for Russian troops to hide within Ukraine's internationally recognized borders. This pair of attacks was executed shortly after Russia launched a surprise attack on the town of Avdivka in eastern Ukraine, encompassing three battalions comprised of some 2,000 troops, along with dozens of armored vehicles and a handful of jets providing air support this would turn out to be the largest assault carried out in this area so far. But this was only the latest flare-up of the ongoing contest for the much-contested municipality of Avdivka. Considered by both sides to be the gateway to the city of Donetsk, the capital of Ukraine's eastern Donbass region, Avdivka not only has significant strategic importance, but the town has been the stage for many frontline battles since Moscow annexed Crimea nine years ago, essentially triggering the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Since then, the town has been heavily fortified, making it extremely difficult for Russian troops to establish a foothold there. This has also turned the town, which had a pre-war population of nearly 32,000, but is now down to around 1,600 residents, mostly living in basements and other sub-ground dwellings, into a symbol of the Ukrainian people's unflinching resistance. Ukrainian defensive positions in Avdivka have allowed its forces to resist repeated Russian attacks, at least for now. At this point, losing this territory would be a tough blow for Ukraine, both strategically and in terms of morale, especially after this summer's highly anticipated counteroffensive resulted in only marginal gains. So why is Biden giving ATAC-Ms to Ukraine such a big deal? Well, for one, Ukrainian forces have, so far, been able to fend off dozens of attacks, so it will certainly be interesting to see how the arrival of ATAC-Ms missiles on the battlefield shifts the advantage. And for two, the ATAC-Ms will undoubtedly play a crucial role on the battlefield, as Kyiv continues to ramp up its assaults on Russian-occupied areas of Crimea. Recently, Ukrainian forces have expanded their attempts to undermine Russian forces, including the launch of a devastating attack on a Russian naval base in Sevastopol back in September that damaged a ship and a submarine and injured 24 people. And more recently, there was the destruction of the two Russian landing crafts by Ukrainian sea drones, an overnight operation that was part of a series of escalating strikes on the peninsula. Ukraine insists that the strikes on Crimea, which have mostly targeted Russian naval bases and vessels, are a critical element of their overall counteroffensive strategy. Ultimately, they want to make it impossible for Russia to continue its assault on the Ukrainian mainland, and in the process, Kyiv is hoping to land a few strategic and symbolic blows against Russian forces which the ATAC-Ms should certainly help with as focus shifts back toward Crimea. The escalation of attacks across Crimea begun after Russia allowed the Black Sea Grain Initiative to lapse this past July, a globally crucial deal that has allowed Ukraine to export grain by sea. Previously, foreign container ships were allowed to bypass Russia's blockade and navigate safely to Turkey's Bosphorus Strait, then onto global markets. Ukraine's uninterrupted export of grain is vital for stabilizing global food prices and bringing relief to many developing countries. The impact this war, and certainly the collapse of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, has had on global food markets has been disastrous, especially given that Ukraine is a major supplier of food to the World Food Programme WFP, an international organization within the UN that provides food assistance across the globe. At a glance, Ukraine's contribution makes up 10% of the global wheat market, 15% of the corn market, and 13% of the barley market. It's also a key player in the world's sunflower oil market, 
According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, another organization within the UN, as many as 47 million people could face serious problems in terms of food insecurity as a result of this war. And now, with Russia's Black Sea Fleet resuming its blockade of Ukraine's ports, vital grain exports are being prevented, creating a direct threat to global food security, what Zelensky has simply called another attempt by Russia to weaponize hunger and destabilize the global food market. This situation has left Ukraine eager to secure its position in Crimea, which has meant, along with their missiles and drone strikes, a stepping up of their clandestine operations as well. Recently, in the occupied city of Luhansk, a car explosion killed pro-Moscow former head of police Mikhail Filipenenko. Representatives of Ukraine's defense intelligence have claimed responsibility for the apparent assassination, saying it was a joint operation carried out with pro-Ukrainian partisans, before issuing a warning of retribution to other pro-Russian officials positioned in occupied areas. There was also, quite recently, the bombing of a Russian train outside the city of Ryazan about 196 kilometers, 122 miles, southeast of Moscow. Placed on a section of track, the improvised explosive device derailed 19 freight cars and caused several injuries. And though Kyiv hasn't officially taken responsibility, that hasn't stopped the Kremlin from making the accusation, citing a series of recent cross-border strikes by Ukrainian forces and their allies. The question seems to be now, other than the success they've already had, how will Kyiv make the most of their new weapon? Ukrainian forces were already familiar with the wheeled M142 high-mobility artillery rocket system, a mobile rocket launcher commonly known as the HIMARS, that are used to carry and fire ATACMs. Up until now, though, the US had only been supplying shorter-range guided rockets, fired from a HIMARS mobile launcher or a tracked M270 multiple launch rocket system, or MLRS. The longest-range variants of the ATACMs can strike targets out to a distance of 300 kilometers. 190 miles. This extension of their reach will more than likely allow Ukrainian forces to launch attacks further into Russian-held territories, including the Crimean Peninsula and other areas bordering the Black Sea. So you might be wondering, besides its impressive range, what's the big deal with ATAC-Ms? Well, to start, most of these 4-meter-long missiles carry a WDU-18 230kg blast fragmentation warhead. They can travel in excess of Mach 3, around 3,700 kilometers, 2,300 miles per hour, and, depending on which variant you choose, they can cost between $820,000 and $1.7 million apiece. The impressive speed of the ATAC-Ms compared to similar cruise missiles, such as the UK's Storm Shadow or Russia's KH-101, has been one of its key selling points, and is due largely to the fact that the ATAC-Ms is, essentially, a ballistic missile with a rocket engine strapped to its back which makes them very hard to shoot out of the sky. Okay, so if these high-tech precision missiles come with a rocket engine on the back, what comes at the front? When it comes to the payload carried on the ATAC-Ms, you've really got two options. One is a unitary warhead, which is basically what it sounds like, a single explosive charge. The other is a submunition warhead, a container filled with lots of submunitions or bomblets. These are also mostly what they sound like a bunch of little bombs that can be dispersed over a large target area. In terms of ATAC-Ms, this means hundreds of steel-cased balls filled with incendiary pellets. So which one is better? Well, it largely depends on your intended target. Unitary warheads are better for destroying specific targets, say a stationary tank, ammunition depot, or a large artillery piece, while submunition warheads will be more effective against moving targets, say a convoy of vehicles or an advancing column of troops. Both warhead variations have been designed with specific target categories in mind, but both can be highly effective against a wide variety of individual targets too. The ATAC-Ms platform also comes with a number of variants, though it's not 100% clear which one President Biden ended up passing on to the Ukrainians. The most widely produced variant is the M39 Block 1, which was added to the US's arsenal in 1991. The original design for this variant had a range of 25 to 165 kilometers, 15 to 100 miles, and carried a payload of 950 incendiary bomblets, each about the size of a baseball and weighing around 0.6 kilograms. And when dispersed above a target, these bomblets can cover an area of 33,000 square meters, 360,000 square feet. Although no longer in production, about 1,650 of the M39 Block 1 variants were made, 
with several hundred of those being used in combat during both Operation Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom. All remaining missiles have been modified to carry a unitary fragmentation warhead. But this hasn't been the only variant to be used in combat over the years. With nearly double the range and a GPS-aided guidance system, the M39A1 variant can reach targets anywhere from 12 to 185 miles 20 to 300 kilometers away, but carries a somewhat smaller payload of just 300 incendiary bomblets. Entering the US's arsenal in 1997, some 610 of these were produced, with around 74 being used in combat, primarily during Operation Iraqi Freedom. This variation is no longer in production, and all remaining units have also had their cluster munition payloads swapped out for a single warhead. Arriving in 2001, the M48 variant, a quick-reaction unitary missile with a GPS-aided guidance system, carries a single 230kg high-explosive warhead and has a maximum range of 185 miles 300 km. It should be noted that when a fragmentation warhead like the one found on this variant and many others, explodes, the blast sends thousands of metallic fragments flying in every direction, much like a 360-degree spray of bullets. Between 2001 and 2004, 176 M4As were produced, 16 of which were used during Operation Iraqi Freedom, while another 42 appeared in combat during Operation Enduring Freedom. The remaining missiles are in the possession of the US Army and Marine Corps. Then there's the M57 variant, which is similar in many ways to the M48, mainly in its ability to carry a single high-explosive warhead out to a distance of some 185 miles or 300 kilometers. Going into production directly after the M48 went out, a little over 500 of these were made, but only 33 have been used in combat, reportedly during Operation Enduring Freedom. The M57 is also very accurate, boasting a circular error probability CEP of less than 9 meters or 30 feet. Typically expressed as a radius, CEP is an important measurement for assessing the accuracy of guided munitions, such as missiles. CEP and missile accuracy in general can be influenced by a range of factors, including guidance system technology and environmental conditions. So essentially, the smaller the CEP, the more accurate the system is considered to be. Let's say, for example, a missile has a CEP of 20 meters. This means there's a high probability, usually greater than 50%, that the actual point of impact will be within a 20 meters radius of the intended target, which means that an M57 ATAC M's missile, fired from, let's say, Brussels, Belgium, or Dunkirk, could reliably hit the Eiffel Tower, as well as a range of smaller targets located at the same distances. Which brings us to the last variant we're going to look at, but certainly not the least, the M57A1, which is basically identical to the M57 in terms of general specifications and capabilities, except for one major difference. The warhead found on this variant comes with an adjustable blast height, allowing for a wider dispersion of bomb fragments should the situation call for it. After looking more closely at the ATAC M's, we can definitely conclude that it has superior speed, range, versatility, accuracy, and explosive power than any other surface-to-surface -surface missile on the market. Its most notable feature, however, might just be the mobility of the system from which it's launched. Because the ATAC M's can be launched from a mobile ground vehicle like the HIMARS, which they're already familiar with, Ukrainian troops can easily shoot and then move over a variety of different terrains. Ukrainian combatants can hide if necessary, they can avoid retaliatory attacks, and most importantly, they can create a sense of uncertainty for the Russians, who won't be able to predict where the next strike might be coming from. In practical terms, this means that a Ukrainian mobile artillery unit traveling in an ATAC M's equipped HIMARS could stop basically anywhere, anytime, and launch a precision attack on a target it would take them perhaps five to six hours to drive to if they could reach it by land at all. Clearly, Washington's gift of the ATAC M's has opened up a range of strategic options for Ukraine's perpetually outnumbered forces, options that could lead to plenty of scenarios where Ukraine has a significant battlefield advantage. The arrival of the ATAC M's could very well allow for easier destruction of Russia's air defense systems, airfields, and other military installations deep within the enemy's territory, as we've already seen Ukraine do when they recently used their new missiles to wipe out a pair of Russian airbases. 
In the wake of this recent news, many of Ukraine's supporters have been quick to applaud Biden's generosity. But it's also important not to get carried away here. Old Uncle Joe didn't just happily hand over a bunch of his precious ATAC Ms the first time Zelensky asked for them. The folks in Washington have actually been quite hesitant to do so, and for two pretty good reasons. One, there's the risk that significantly increasing Kyiv's fighting ability might also increase the tension between the US and Russia. And two, the US also had its own national security needs to consider, as its stockpile of ATAC Ms, which have been out of production since 2017, has continued to dwindle. The latter issue, however, keeping enough ATAC Ms on hand to balance its own security needs with those of Ukraine and Europe as a whole, seems to have been mostly resolved by the recent arrival of a suitable replacement. And it is fancy. In March 2016, Lockheed Martin and Raytheon Technologies announced they'd be working in tandem to develop a missile that would meet the US Army's replacement requirements. This new missile, if it would indeed end up shouldering out the ATAC Ms, would need not only advanced propulsion, allowing it to fly faster and farther, it would also need to be thinner and sleeker. For what purpose, you ask? So that the loadout could be increased to two per pod, doubling the number of missiles that could be carried by the HIMARS or tracked by the M270 MLRS. Well, the Army ultimately got what they wanted, introducing the Precision Strike Missile, or PRISM for short, which has reportedly left production and will be entering US stockpiles in the near future, if it hasn't already. The PRISM, which would ultimately be developed by Lockheed Martin, is at the leading edge of long-range precision strike missiles. With an equally cool-sounding name compared to the ATAC Ms, this next-generation surface-to-surface weapon uses enhanced attack capabilities to neutralize, suppress, and destroy targets at a distance of 310 plus miles over 499 kilometers. On top of increased range, lethality, in-flight survivability, and missile loadout, the PRISM also comes with an advanced cluster munition warhead comprised of preformed fragments. While the PRISM development program started out as a competitive effort between Lockheed and Raytheon, Raytheon would end up withdrawing from the competition in early 2020 due to technical issues that delayed their missile's flight test. The original intent of both companies was to reach a maximum range of no more than 499 kilometers, due to restrictions outlined in the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty signed by former President Ronald Reagan and former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev in 1987. Among other restrictions, the INF Treaty prevents signatories from developing missiles that can travel 500 kilometers or more, but these limitations went out the window in August 2019, when former President Donald Trump decided to withdraw from the treaty. This decision came after more than a decade of accusations, coming from both the US and Russia, that the other had violated the terms of the treaty. And so, with a brand new long-range precision missile in their arsenal, and who knows what variants on the way, the only thing that will stop Washington from providing ATAC Ms to Ukraine was Russian President Vladimir Putin's uncertain reaction. In short, he wasn't pleased. So far, Putin has said that the US providing Kyiv with ATAC Ms was a big mistake, and that the US is wading deeper and deeper into a conflict the Russian leader believes is none of its business. Previously, Putin called the delivery of ATAC Ms to Ukraine a red line that the US had better not cross. Yet, he's also stated that the ATAC Ms will not make a significant difference on the battlefield, that Russian forces will have no trouble repelling attacks, and this intrusion by the US will only serve to prolong this war and bring more suffering to the people of Ukraine. But this isn't the first time Putin has brought up the subject of long-range missiles. When Russia initially marched more than 100,000 troops to the border of Ukraine, two months before they invaded, the Kremlin also sent NATO a list of demands that was structured as more of a one-sided treaty, along with the articles insisting that NATO both shuts its doors to new members and remove all its forces from the 14 countries that joined after the Soviet Union collapsed. One article declares that no land-based missiles be deployed to areas that would allow them to reach any territory belonging to Russia. Technically, the missiles haven't gotten closer. Their range has just increased. But still, this was the red line Putin was referring to. But now that it's been crossed, the Russian president doesn't seem overly concerned. This could be because he was expecting it, or because the delivery of the ATAC Ms, however significant their future impact could be, is only a small part of a much larger delivery from the US, a delivery that's come to exceed $76 billion in humanitarian, financial, and military support, which has been offered to Ukraine by the Biden administration and the US Congress since the war began. 
while dozens of other countries have also provided large aid packages to Ukraine, including most members of NATO and the European Union, the US has really taken the lead. So far, the US has delivered surveillance and attack drones, coastal defense ships, satellite communications equipment, and advanced surveillance and radar systems. They've sent over hundreds of Abrams tanks and artillery pieces, thousands of Humvees and other tactical vehicles, tens of thousands of rockets, missiles, and various other munitions, not to mention several types of anti-aircraft missiles, including 12 National Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile Systems NASAMs, and one Patriot Air Defense Battery plus munitions. And on top of 35,000 grenade launchers and small arms with ammunition, other extremely helpful but less publicized items the US has sent to Ukraine include night vision and thermal imagery systems, laser rangefinders, C4 explosives, explosive ordnance disposal equipment, M18A1 Claymore mines, cold weather gear, and generators. Breaking down the numbers, around $3.9 billion, or 5% of the total, has gone to humanitarian aid in the form of emergency food assistance, healthcare, and refugee support, among other resources, while another 26.4 billion, or 34%, has gone to financial and budgetary aid via loans and the Economic Support Fund, an economic assistance fund used to advance the US's political and strategic interests by helping allied countries meet their political, economic, and security needs. And the rest of that 75 plus billion dollars that's all gone directly or indirectly to weapons, ammunition, and military equipment. Nearly a quarter of the total, around $18.3 billion, has been allocated for security assistance in the form of training, equipment, weapons, and logistic support provided via the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, a program initiated by the U.S. Department of Defense with the intention of providing help to Ukraine by enhancing its defense capabilities and mitigating certain security challenges, mainly a Russian invasion. Another $23.5 billion worth of weapons and military equipment has come directly from the DoD's personal supply. And still, another $4.7 billion has come in the form of grants and loans for weapons and equipment via the Foreign Military Financing Program, another U.S. initiative, this one providing grants and loans to nations so they can purchase weapons, defense equipment and services, and military training from the U.S. through government-to-government -government sales. Long before crossing Putin's metaphorical red line with his delivery of ATAC Ms, Biden also stirred up the hornet's nest, as well as some international controversy, when he agreed to furnish Ukraine with cluster munitions, which most countries have banned due to the increased risk their use poses to civilians by one, their lack of precision, and two, the danger of undetonated ordnance being triggered accidentally later on. Still, a number of analysts in the West have asserted that the assistance offered by the US, as well as its allies, has been crucial in Ukraine's continued defense, and has even created the opportunity to launch a number of critical counter-offensives against Russia. Some analysts, as well as many supporters of Ukraine, also believe the country's failure to expel Russia will result in the subjugation of millions of Ukrainians, while simultaneously fueling Putin's ambitions to recover territory that once belonged to the former Soviet Union which might also end up encouraging China to pursue or enhance similar aggressive tactics. Which means military support for Ukraine will likely continue. To a significant degree, though it has certainly not been alone, the US has led the world in offering security assistance to Ukraine. Their javelins have halted Russian tanks during their savage assault on Kyiv. Their air defense systems have intercepted Russian strikes aimed at Ukrainian infrastructure. The US has also provided financial and humanitarian assistance, which has helped Ukraine maintain highly fundamental services such as healthcare and heat. Many NATO members, including the US and other allied nations, have, too, been cautious about getting directly involved in the conflict, being concerned, primarily, with Putin's not-so-subtle threats of starting a nuclear war. As we've seen, however, governments across the world have overcome their initial hesitancy and provided Ukraine with increasingly sophisticated assets including battle tanks, modern fighter aircraft, and now, high-tech, long-range, precision missile systems. But what do you think? Has the US crossed a line by sending atac -Ms to Ukraine? Should NATO and its allies simply stay out of it? Are we inching closer to a global nuclear conflict instigated by Russia? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Why hasn't the Russian Air Force managed to take control of Ukraine's skies, despite operating one of the world's largest air forces? 
Experts from all over the world agreed that after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, that it would only be a matter of days until the Russian Air Force took complete control of the country's airspace. Air supremacy is one of the cornerstones of modern warfare. It safeguards the advance of troops on the ground, and it strongly limits the movement of enemy forces. For the Russian Air Force, the destruction of the Ukrainian air defenses was the obvious move to secure air supremacy. But that didn't happen. Despite having a significantly smaller air force, the Ukrainian air force isn't just still flying, but to Putin's surprise, they're not just surviving, but destroying Russian aircraft. So then why is Russia having such a hard time bringing down an enemy that is a fraction of its size? Some experts claim that this is actually a strategic decision by Russia. As far-fetched as it may seem, there's a case to be made that Russia intended to capture Ukraine and incorporate it into the Russian Federation. Destroying the entire Ukrainian Air Force and all of its associated infrastructure would mean that Russia would then have to turn around and invest in rebuilding everything they had just blown up. Not a great move from a financial perspective. At the same time, some reports suggest that Russia's lack of progress in asserting their dominance has nothing to do with a desire to take over the Ukrainian air assets, but is still related to the country's financial situation. Instead, it's been reported that there is considerable fear among Russian military leaders of suffering heavy losses of their costly aircraft, many of which are in short supply and cannot be replaced in the short or even medium term. And they would have good reason to fear that they would face heavy losses, since there's no doubt that the air resistance of the Ukrainians has been impressive. A plethora of videos posted on social media show Russian fighter jets and helicopters dropping like flies after being hit. Russia has lost hundreds of aircraft during the invasion of Ukraine and has demonstrated little ability to respond to attacks by a markedly inferior air force. This has led to a dramatic re-examination of the image presented by the Russian military to outsiders. Russia's once feared air force is now losing credibility, and many in the West no longer see it as the threat it once was. So what happened to cause these large-scale losses? In addition to their supply chain issues, the Russian Air Force now appears to lack the structural capacity to properly plan, coordinate, and fly large-scale missions. And as a result, they are failing to dominate the skies in Ukraine. The Russian Air Force also relied heavily on the accuracy of missile strikes, targeting air bases in the early stages of the invasion. But Russia doesn't have a large number of laser-guided precision bombs, which would enable them to safely conduct high-altitude strikes. As a consequence, they are obliged to fly at low altitudes, which means they are vulnerable to Ukrainian missile attacks and drones. Now, they are mainly using dumb bombs, which are not as accurate, and therefore they significantly increase civilian casualties. So Russia has been left in a precarious situation where they can no longer rely on safer high-altitude strikes, but can't fly low-altitude missions without the risk of losing even more aircraft. But that's not the end of the issues within the military hierarchy. Russian leaders initially told their pilots they were on their way to carry out exercises. And then they were surprised to discover that they were caught in actual combat situations. The shock at suddenly being thrown into war has had its own psychological knock-on effect on the pilots who weren't ready for the stresses of battle. The Ukrainians, by contrast, had no misconceptions about what was happening. They are fighting for their country, and they have a clear purpose. And their morale is quite high, even though they face overwhelming odds each day. One vital factor in this war that cannot be overlooked is Western aid. While Ukraine actually had weapons comparable to the Russian ones, they had them in much, much smaller quantities. So without the modern weapons provided by the US and the donations from other NATO countries, Ukraine wouldn't have withstood the invasion for so long. And it appears that the US is going to continue to provide Ukraine with ongoing military aid in the multiple billions of dollars. But just as students of history are well aware, the failure of the Russian Air Force to gain air supremacy so far does not mean that it won't succeed in the future. There's nothing to stop an increasingly desperate Putin from throwing everything the country has at Ukraine. Mounting large-scale complex air operations or even opening another front in Finland and advancing to the West. It isn't guaranteed that either of these strategies would work, and the world will have to continue to wait and watch to see if the overmatched Ukrainians can continue to resist the once vaunted Russian Air Force. Putin's invasion is not going as planned. After 10 months of war in Ukraine, Russia has failed to take any of the country's major cities and has suffered staggering losses, with estimates nearing 100,000 dead. 
As the war has shifted away from urban combat and towards a protracted artillery battle in the east, the tide has turned even further in favor of Ukraine. Armed with billions of dollars of advanced Western military hardware, Ukrainian troops have achieved a string of significant victories in the Kherson and Donbass regions. As of November the 14th, they had reclaimed 54% of the land originally captured by Russia. This has mainly been enabled by the influx of deadlier, more accurate weaponry like satellite-guided missiles, exploding autonomous drones, and a huge stockpile of artillery. How is Russia dealing with these huge setbacks? As the Russian army has been forced back across the Dnipro River, Putin's tactics have grown harsher. Indiscriminate attacks on Ukrainian apartments, schools, and hospitals are common, while Russian troops are being sent to the front lines with little equipment or training. To replace his enormous losses, Putin announced a partial mobilization of more than 300,000 Russian conscripts in September. The move was intended to dramatically increase Russia's infantry combat power, but the result has been seriously underwhelming. Now, in an attempt to avoid more humiliating defeats, Putin and his top generals have adopted a human wave strategy, one which could spell disaster for Russia. But why? The answer has a lot to do with Russia's military history and Putin's many issues since invading Ukraine. Human wave attacks are one of the most brutal and costly tactics available to military leaders. They involve an unprotected frontal assault on enemy lines by densely packed infantry troops, designed to overwhelm defenders in close-range combat. This inevitably involves sacrificing large numbers of the attacker's own troops as cannon fodder, usually making a human wave a last resort. And while human wave tactics are rarely used by modern militaries, they have a long history in warfare. Their modern use was pioneered in conflicts of the late 19th century such as the American Civil War and the Boxer Rebellion in China. These were also some of the earliest conflicts involving machine guns, which were used to decimate enemy charges while attackers tried to overrun defensive positions with their sheer numbers. Russia and the USSR used human wave tactics in numerous conflicts, such as the Russo-Japanese War, the Russian Civil War, and both world wars. While it has often proved highly effective, the strategy has also resulted in extensive Soviet and Russian casualties on a number of occasions. During the Battle of Stalingrad, the single deadliest battle of World War II, Soviet commanders attempted to hug the German forces by keeping their troops as close to them as physically possible. At the same time, artillery and bombs would pummel the front line. While these tactics greatly slowed the Germans and ultimately turned the tide, they also led to nearly a million Soviet casualties in that battle alone. This was achieved partially by shooting any soldier who retreated, as Joseph Stalin was quoted saying, in the Soviet army it takes more courage to retreat than advance. And since Putin's invasion of Ukraine has already led to over 100,000 Russian deaths, he seems to have decided to sacrifice as many soldiers as necessary to hold eastern Ukraine. It also appears that Putin hopes his threats of nuclear Armageddon will keep Ukraine's armed forces at bay until he can reinforce his manpower on the ground. Yet even his mobilization is hardly going as planned. As an article from several military experts puts it, Russian reservist battalions are to be sent to the front in Ukraine after a minimum of two to three weeks training to form weak units to hold the line or be expended in senseless assaults more similar to human waves than to modern combined arms warfare. Some have compared the situation to that of the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s, where Iran sent tens of thousands of untrained conscripts to charge the front lines and counter Iraq's superior weaponry. But where many Iranian soldiers had morale, in Russia it looks to be the opposite. Far more Russians have fled abroad than have actually joined the military through conscription, perhaps because the chance of becoming a casualty is so high. A recent report from the Ukrainian general staff found that one Russian battalion lost over 520 men, close to half of its total strength. The reservists needed to fill gaps like these probably don't expect to live very long themselves. There are also many reports of draft tickets being delivered to those who should be exempt from Putin's mobilization, such as chronically ill and disabled Russians, active university students, and defense industry workers. In some cases, even already deceased citizens have had their names drawn on draft tickets. A recent law from Putin also began drafting criminals convicted of murder, robbery, larceny, drug trafficking, or other serious offenses, many of whom find themselves part of the most brutal battles yet. And because of their inadequate training, Russian conscripts from all backgrounds are often unable to use the more advanced weaponry like missiles and artillery, 
leaving them with only the most basic firepower. So what happens to these men on the battlefield? Once they arrive at the front, sometimes with only a day or two of training, things are not likely to get better for Russians. Basic equipment is extremely limited, with soldiers lacking guns, ammunition, and even proper clothing. Several reports note that the recruits have been told to take with them warm clothing, sleeping bags, personal hygiene items, first aid kits, blankets, etc. They are mostly not issued body armor. Because of this, the approaches they can take in combat are seriously limited. This is evident in the recent fighting across the Donbass region in Ukraine's east over key roads, some of the most ferocious since the war began. If Ukraine can retake the roads, it will make Russian efforts to resupply even harder and deal another serious blow to Putin. So in a last-ditch effort not to lose any more territory, Russia has dug in while wave upon wave of infantry troops storm Ukrainian positions. Much like in past conflicts, the cost of this human wave strategy has been enormous. Some reports indicate that Russia is losing as many as 800 soldiers a day in its effort to halt the Ukrainian advance. In the front lines of Russia's human wave are the recently conscripted criminals, many coming directly from penal colonies in Siberia and elsewhere. In some places, this has become so horrific that medics have taken to referring to it as the meat grinder. Behind the convicts are the recently mobilized troops, most of whom are treated little better than the hardened criminals. Many are drawn from the poorest and most marginalized areas of Russia and face a life in prison if they object. Behind the conscripts are regular soldiers, known as barrier troops, who are under orders to shoot anyone that retreats. As military analyst and professor Michael Clark puts it, the idea is you go forward or you die. This scorched earth approach may be partly a result of the top Russian general now in charge of the invasion, Sergei Surovakin. Surovakin was previously in charge of Russia's operations in Syria, where he unleashed devastating airstrikes against rebel held areas. Described by the UK Defense Ministry as brutal and corrupt, Surovakin also has a long history of human wave style strategies and attacks on civilians in Syria, Chechnya, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. He was quoted by Russian military bloggers as saying that, I don't want to sacrifice Russian soldiers' lives in a guerrilla war against hordes of fanatics armed by NATO, and that we have enough technical means to force Ukraine to surrender. For Sorovakin, this means concentrating Russia's troops in certain areas, while wreaking havoc on Ukraine's civilian population through attacks on the electrical grid and other key institutions. But while this is in some ways similar to its past approaches, Russia today faces many different constraints, and this time around a human wave strategy that could prove to be disastrous for the country. For one thing, modern Russia lacks the population to sustain such a devastating approach to warfare. Any country taking heavy combat losses will eventually be unable to replace them fast enough. This may be especially true here since, in the span of a single year, Russia has lost more soldiers than the United States did across the entire Vietnam War. It lost more soldiers in the first two weeks of the invasion than the US did during 20 years in Afghanistan and Iraq. These catastrophic numbers could mean that Russia will soon reach a state of combat fatigue. Ben Barry, a senior fellow at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, has stated that Russia has assembled what I call a steamroller. We don't know at what point Russia will run out of steam. Battlefield success is usually measured by relative casualties and territory gained or lost, but by either measure, Russia appears to be falling behind. This suggests that there may be a point in the coming months where Putin's government reaches a culminating point where an offensive runs out of supplies or sustains so many casualties that it can't be sustained. Russian artillery strikes have been decreasing for months, even as Putin seeks out cheaper weapons like Iranian-made Shahed Kamikaze drones. This indicates to many that Russian arms are running low, likely the result of sanctions and the powerful HIMARS rocket systems which Ukraine has used to destroy ammunition depots. Mark A. Milley, chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, has stated that Ukraine is steadily degrading the Russian ability to supply their troops, command and control of their forces. Russia's human wave tactics will likely only delay this process, but the costs may be too high to bear. Whatever course the war takes this winter, it is unlikely to become less brutal anytime soon, especially since the colder weather will likely result in even more casualties. But will Sorovakin's human wave tactics work? Or will Ukrainians continue to retake their territory as Russia is forced to fall back? Let us know what you think in the comments below. 
and don't forget to subscribe for more expert military analysis. In February 2022, Vladimir Putin's invasion plan backfired. Despite repeated attempts, Russian forces weren't able to take Kyiv within days like Putin thought, and in a span of a few months they were pushed back into Ukraine's eastern Donbass region. Many have now come to take the prowess of the Ukrainian armed forces for granted, forgetting that it required a combination of luck, skill, and strategy, along with staggering Russian incompetence, to bring the conflict to where it stands today. Now, with another Ukrainian counteroffensive on the horizon, let's take a look back at just how Ukraine managed to prevent Russian victory on day one. The invasion began early in the morning on February 24, 2022. At 5 a.m. local time, Putin gave a televised speech where he announced his decision to launch a so-called special military operation in Ukraine. In the speech, Putin stated Russia would seek the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine and that all responsibility for possible bloodshed will be entirely on the conscience of the regime ruling in the territory of Ukraine. Zelensky's government was framed as neo-Nazis under NATO control who were developing nuclear weapons to strike at Russia. As justification for an invasion, Putin declared the need to protect the people of Donbas, who he falsely claimed had been facing humiliation and genocide perpetrated by the Kyiv regime. Only minutes after Putin's speech, explosions were reported in Kyiv, Kharkiv, Odessa and the Donbas region. This massive barrage of caliber cruise missiles rained down across the country, destroying a substantial number of Ukraine's air defense sites and radars. When combined with electronic warfare attacks, this onslaught gave Putin one of his only real victories in the war, disrupting Ukraine's dense air defense network and very briefly giving Russia air superiority. Close to the same time Russian troops had landed in Mariupol and nearby areas, while more Russian crews and ballistic missiles struck military command posts, airfields and ammunition depots in places like Kyiv, Kharkiv and Dnipro. At the same time, video showed Russian military vehicles crossing the border from Belarus as well as Russian annexed Crimea. In an initial sign of cohesion, top Ukrainian officials responded very quickly to the attack. Ukrainian Interior Minister Denis Monastirsky woke up to frantic calls informing him of the Russian advance. He immediately called President Zelensky, telling him that it has started. In an interview, he later recalled that in the first minutes, they delivered terrible blows to our air defense, terrible blows to our troops in general. There were 20-meter craters, the likes of which no one has seen in their lifetimes. The Kremlin's initial plan seemed to be targeting Ukraine's command and control centers with everything they could muster, while using a blitzkrieg strategy with helicopters and fighter jets to quickly obtain air superiority. Faced with this onslaught, almost no experts or analysts believed Ukraine had a chance. The Center for Naval Analyses said Russia would use a so-called pincer movement to surround Kyiv and cut off Ukraine's forces in the east. If it had been a success, as most assumed it would, this would have allowed Russian forces to remove the Ukrainian government and kill or force the surrender of all those isolated from the capital. The Center for Strategic and International Studies identified three axes of the Russian advance, from Belarus in the north, from Donetsk in the center, and from Crimea in the south, arguing that in each Russian troops would overwhelm defenders in days. Even government supportive of Ukraine gave them little chance. U.S. intelligence suggested that Russia intended a decapitation strike on Ukraine's government and that Kyiv would most likely fall within 96 hours. Later that same day, Russian forces began large-scale amphibious offensives near Kharkiv and Mariupol, where more troops poured in from the Belarusian border. These Russians pressed into the exclusion zone around the defunct Chernobyl nuclear plant, where the head of the Ukrainian border guard sector, Vitaly Yavorsky, would later find evidence that they had dug trenches in radioactive soil and eaten contaminated deer they shot in the nearby woods. Intense fighting broke out all throughout the east of the country, with Russian troops steadily advancing toward Kyiv. In the strikes, more than two dozen Mi-8s entered Ukrainian airspace. These transport helicopters carried over 100 of Russia's most elite air assault troops, supposed to be the very best of the Russian military. Alongside the Mi-8s were a small fleet of Ka-52 attack helicopters, meant to provide escort security and fire support. Deployed from an airbase in Belarus, they traveled over 150 miles and had already been in the air when Putin announced his invasion. Attempting to avoid what air defense remained intact, the choppers flew fast and low, skimming the treetops above Ukrainian towns and villages. Their target was Hostomel Airport, also known as Antonov Airfield, a major hub outside of Kyiv. Controlling the airport would have allowed Russia to fly in thousands of its troops directly to the capital, 
allowing Putin to carry out the decapitation strike against the government of Vladimir Zelensky. But right from the get-go, not everything went as planned. The first major mistake of the assault on Hostomel was limited Russian equipment. Ideally, such an attack would have been carried out before dawn to catch defending troops unaware. But even Russia's elite air assault teams lacked the proper night vision equipment to do so and were forced to begin the attack at sunrise. However, this left the Ukrainian defenders with a clear view of the attacking force, something they took advantage of. As the helicopters made their approach over the tree line from the Dnieper River, they were immediately attacked by Ukrainian machine guns, small arms fire, and shoulder-mounted surface-to-air rockets or manpads. Throughout the first days of the invasion, manpads such as the US-produced Stinger would prove critical to the defense of Kyiv and other major cities. Relatively light and portable at 35 pounds, the Stinger missile system is also highly accurate. Using an infrared seeker to lock onto the heat in an engine's exhaust, and able to hit nearly anything flying below 11,000 feet. While other Ukrainian shoulder-mounted missile systems are not as effective, their combined effect on Russian air power was staggering. On the morning of the 24th, the Russian helicopters countered by deploying flares, but several Mi-8s were recorded taking fire and hitting the water. At least one Ka-52 was shot down, crashing into the far riverbank as its two pilots ejected. At the same time, five Mikoyan MiG-29s from the Ukrainian 40th Tactical Aviation Brigade also intercepted the formation. These jets reportedly shot at least two more helicopters and harassed the Russian air support needed for the landing. When they arrived at Hostomel, Russian troops prepared for an airborne landing by striking the airport with more rockets, some of them destroying Ukraine's air defenses. One defender who witnessed the initial barrage stated they opened fire at anything within reach all the buildings that any people they saw moving around, regardless of whether they were military or civilians, they didn't care. They were just firing wherever they detected movement. Ukrainian officials would also later conclude that an airport employee was working for Russian intelligence, revealing their hidden positions. But while the targeted rocket barrage did provide cover for troop landings, it failed to significantly weaken the other air defenses surrounding the airport, something which would become important later but Russian troops soon made their landing and began to try to capture the airport, expecting only light resistance and a relatively quick surrender. The roughly 300 Ukrainian defenders of Hostomel were even more under-equipped, and many were recent conscripts who had never seen battle. Because of these factors, their resistance was limited, and they were steadily pushed back by the advancing Russians, but they didn't give up. With one National Guardsman, Serhii Faletuk, successfully shooting down a Russian helicopter, with a 9K-38 Igla and boosting the spirits of the conscripts. By midday, however, the Ukrainian defenders were overwhelmed, and Russia was able to take the airport, where its troops began preparing for airlifts of fresh troops. But then things started to go very wrong. Despite overcoming the initial defenders at the airport, Russian troops continued to take fire from armed local civilians all around the airport, while Ukraine began to bombard the position with heavy artillery. Then, at a critical moment of the battle, a large-scale Ukrainian counterattack was launched by the 4th Rapid Reaction Brigade of the National Guard, backed by the Ukrainian Air Force. Lacking armored vehicles, the Russian forces were dependent on air support to hold off the Ukrainian advances. In an effort to push back the counterattack, two Russian Su-25 fighter jets also began to attack Ukrainian positions, but they were met by those Ukrainian planes which survived the first missile barrages, at least two Su-24s and a MiG-29. This aerial dogfight gave Ukraine more time to rush in ground forces to the airport, which included elite units from the Georgian Legion and Ukrainian air assault forces. Amid all this fighting, the planes carrying fresh Russian reinforcements could not land and were forced to turn around and head back north. These massive Ilyushin 76S transports would have been critical to a quick Russian capture of the airport, allowing them to create a foothold and stop Ukrainian defenders from overwhelming the temporary Russian positions. The fact that they were not able to land was one of the first major turning points in the war and would be catastrophic for the Russian attack on Kyiv. Heavy fighting ensued around Hostomel for the rest of the day. By the early evening, Ukrainian units were able to surround the airport. Without the reinforcements Russia needed, its troops were essentially penned down, and many of those who remained were pushed into the forest outside the airport to try to take cover. And by this point, it was also clear that Ukrainian soldiers and their allies would fight to the last man and employ any tactics necessary to overcome their quantitative disadvantages. 
Georgian Legion commander Mamuka Mamulashvili later claimed that when his men ran out of ammunition in the battle, he actually used his car to run over retreating Russian paratroopers. Sporadic fighting continued throughout the night until early the next morning. Then Russian reinforcements coming from Belarus, along with another air assault, were able to break through the Ukrainian defenses around the airport. While some of the ground convoys were ambushed, enough made it through to push out the Ukrainians from Hostomel. When it became clear they would have to temporarily give up the airport, Ukraine sabotaged much of the airport, blowing holes in the runway to stop Russian planes from landing. So, while Russian troops were in control of Hostomel, the airport was too badly damaged to be of much value something which likely made all the difference in stopping Putin's lightning attack. Ukraine would regain control of the airport by April 2nd, but their initial resistance to Russian advances was a vital moment, which would set the tone for the rest of the conflict. Throughout the next few weeks, the airport would be used as a Russian ammunition depot and forward operating base, but the runway remained too damaged to land on. While it took until late March, Russia was eventually forced to flee Hostomel. In their hasty retreat, Russian troops destroyed much of their own equipment while other material was captured intact by the Ukrainians. In addition, other Russian equipment had been destroyed by Ukrainian artillery strikes before the withdrawal. Overall, Russia lost at least seven armored fighting vehicles, 23 infantry fighting vehicles, three armored personnel carriers, one anti-aircraft gun, two field artillery pieces, three helicopters, as well as 67 trucks, vehicles, and jeeps at Antonov Airport. Elsewhere in Ukraine, the same pattern of unexpected resistance was taking place during the first days of the war. While Russian troops advancing from Crimea entered the city of Kherson late in the day on the 24th, they continued to take heavy fire from multiple directions. They were able to take control of the North Crimean Canal, allowing them to resume water flow to the peninsula, but experienced overwhelming hostility from the locals. Kherson would later become another critical point of Ukrainian resistance, depriving Putin of the easy victory he seemed to think he was assured. Several other instances of Ukrainian resistance would take place on the invasion's first day. One of these was in the Black Sea, on the tiny spit of land known as Snake Island. Located roughly 30 miles off the coast, Snake Island is strategically important, allowing whoever controls it to blockade Odessa and dominate large parts of the Black Sea. The Russian Navy attacked the island expecting its tiny garrison of defenders to simply lay down their weapons and surrender, but the attack soon went viral and became an iconic symbol of Ukraine's determination. The Russian cruiser Moskva began to fire on the garrison, demanding their surrender. Instead, Ukrainian border guard Roman Hrybov famously responded with the phrase, Russian warship, yourself. This was emblematic of Ukraine's refusal to give up, helping to fuel the defenders' determination. As news of Russian brutality and Ukrainian heroism spread like wildfire, there was intense resistance across the country by the morning of February 25th. Most observers still assumed that Russia could take Kyiv through overwhelming force, especially as tank columns miles long rolled toward the city. But much like Hostomel, Kherson, and Snake Island, the determination and clever tactics employed by the defenders had a serious impact. In particular, General Colonel Alexander Sirsky, in charge of Ukraine's ground troops, executed his ambushes masterfully. Initially shocked by the speed and scale of the invasion, Sirsky quickly adapted. He determined that to reach the capital, the Russian tanks would need to use only two or three major highways. So his forces were arrayed in two rings, one in the outer suburbs and one within the city. Designed to keep artillery and tank fire as far from most civilians as possible, he divided the city and surrounding region into sectors, assigning experienced generals to lead each, and establishing a clear chain of command, where tactical decisions could be made on the spot without asking headquarters. Due to these decisions, Russian forces in the north of the country were heavily engaged by these elements of the Ukrainian military, especially as long tank columns began to really suffer from the ambushes. Ukrainians hiding in ditches, bushes, and abandoned buildings throughout the suburbs of Kyiv used anti-tank missiles and mines to trap Russian armor in kill zones where they could not retreat. Once tanks in the rear had been blown up, the defenders then called down artillery strikes on the trapped columns. By repeating this tactic multiple times, Ukraine was able to massively slow the Russian advance with comparatively few casualties. As an investigation by the Washington Post would later conclude, the defenders would also take advantage of terrain around the capital, dense forests, narrow roads, winding rivers that favored their guerrilla tactics, as well as weather short of freezing that thawed the land and bogged down Russian vehicles. 
In response, as Russian forces approached Kyiv, they deployed specialized Spetsnaz units to try and infiltrate the capital and hunt for government officials. At the same time, both Chechen special forces and Wagner Group mercenaries made several attempts to assassinate Zelensky. But remarkably, according to Ukrainian intelligence, these efforts were stopped by anti-war officials in Russia's FSB, who shared intelligence of the plans. While managing to avoid these groups, Zelensky's government asked residents of the city to prepare Molotov cocktails, while distributing over 18,000 guns to those willing to defend their homes. Throughout the day, fighting intensified in the Kyiv suburbs. By the evening, the Pentagon stated that Russia had not established air superiority over Ukrainian airspace. As U.S. analysts had predicted, Ukrainian air defense capabilities had been pummeled by Russian attacks, but remained operational. The Pentagon also assessed that Russian troops were not advancing as quickly as either U.S. intelligence or Moscow had believed they would, that Russia had not taken any population centers, and that Ukrainian command and control was still intact. These facts were among the first real signs that the war was not playing out as anticipated, and that Ukraine could possibly hold its own. Similarly, Russian forces had still failed to take or even encircle Kyiv by the end of the day. Experts from the Institute for the Study of War (ISW) reported that poor planning and execution was already leading to issues with logistics and morale for the Russian troops in the north of Ukraine. According to U.S. and U.K. intelligence, a major reason for this was that Russian forces faced shortages of gasoline and diesel fuel, leading to tanks and armored vehicles stalling and slowing their advance. Combined with the effectiveness and asymmetric costs of Ukraine's ambush tactics, these first two days of the war ensured that Ukraine was able to hold its own until military aid from the West began to arrive. Many experts have since reflected on the significance of these early stages of the war, particularly around Kyiv and Hostomel. Security analyst Andrew McGregor described the battle for Hostomel Airport as a Russian airborne disaster. It would become clear later that the entire Russian strategy hinged on early control of the airport, allowing them to surge into Kyiv and end the war in a matter of days. But Russian intelligence had failed to assess the number and determination of Ukrainian defenders around the airport, and assumed it would take limited fire. But that didn't happen, and when the initial landing force was too small to hold the area, the Russian military was unable to secure air transport for reinforcements as well as prevent Ukrainian counterattacks. Other experts have expressed similar ideas. The Atlantic Council argues that Ukraine's ability to defend the airport for two whole days possibly prevented a rapid capture of Kyiv, while another expert noted that it broke the back of the Russian assault. Researcher Severin Player had suggested that the Battle of Antonov Airport showcased the Russian military's general failures during the invasion, including difficulties with main weapon systems, failures in logistics coordination and planning, as well as a lack of leadership and training. According to him, the fighting for the airport also highlighted that the Russian battalion tactical groups are not well suited for warfare, as they hinder coordination and communication. And because Russia was totally unprepared for the ferocity of the Ukrainian defense, their blitzkrieg turned into a drawn-out siege and a counter-siege. As a result, the attacking force was only able to seize the target at a later date when it had become much less strategically significant, resulting in major issues for the overall Russian plan of attack. But perhaps just as important as the tactical benefits of Ukraine's early resistance was the psychological effect it created. Journalist Andreas Rusch had argued that the Battle of Antonov Airport, alongside the other early battles during the invasion, disproved the myth of the capabilities and near-invincibility of the Russian airborne forces. These claims, which had been extensively fostered by propaganda in Russia and reinforced by rosy analyses from military experts around the world, while more than a year of war has now made it obvious that Russia's military is not all it was hyped up to be, it was the fierce Ukrainian resistance which destroyed the facade. And none of this would have been possible without those first remarkable days, where a combination of grit, tactics, and luck enabled Ukraine to hold its ground. Due to all the factors, the war has been raging for more than a year, rather than the few days which Putin believed it would last. So what do you think? How critical were the first days of the war? And what does it tell us about where it might be going this year? Let us know in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. Imagine a non-guided aerial weapon, meticulously designed to unleash its power upon release from an aircraft. The MK-20, also called the CBU-100 Cluster Bomb, boasts a robust body, 
crafted from top-notch aluminium, clocking in at just under 500 pounds. But what sets this weapon apart is what happens next. Once airborne, the container housing 247 heat submunitions known as MK118 dramatically opens, causing them to rain down on a designated target zone with devastating force. Putin, are you scared yet? Well, you should be. Ukraine just asked the US for a bunch of these babies and its request has been generously granted. This, however, has been the subject of some controversy. But why? How is Ukraine using this weapon and what could it mean for the war going forward? Let's find out. On Friday, July 7th, 2023, the United States declared that it would be supplying Ukraine with cluster bombs in a decision that President Joe Biden said had been a very difficult one to make. The move was controversial even among America's closest allies. The United Kingdom, Canada and New Zealand, partners with the United States in the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance, all said they were opposed to the move. Spain, a NATO ally, also declared its opposition. The United Nations Human Rights Office also opposed the measure and urged both sides in the war to stop the use of cluster bombs without delay. As mentioned, cluster bombs are dropped from a plane or delivered from an artillery shell, rocket or missile. The weapon begins as a single container. This container then breaks apart and releases many small bomblets indiscriminately over a wide area. Over 120 countries have banned the use of these weapons because of this indiscriminate nature, fearing the risks that they pose to civilians. The individual cluster bomblets that get released from the initial container also have a high rate of failure. Many of them are duds. These duds can then linger on the ground for decades and accidentally go off when somebody interacts with them. Cluster bombs therefore pose some of the same problems to civilians that landmines do. For example, the United States dropped 260 million cluster munitions in Laos as part of its operations in the Vietnam War. Over 60 years later, large tracts of land in Laos remain uninhabited because of unexploded cluster bomblets in the area. The United States and Russia are not parties to the Convention on Cluster Munitions. This treaty, which went into effect on August 1, 2010, bans the countries that adhere to it from using, acquiring, developing, stockpiling and transferring cluster munitions. Countries involved in the convention are even prohibited from assisting other countries from interacting with cluster bombs in any way. They cannot help them manufacture their own cluster weapons, for example. Ukraine is not a signatory to the Convention on Cluster Munitions either, and in April 2023 at the Munich Security Conference, it requested the United States to deliver these weapons, which it has long desired. However, this desire could harm its international image, which up until this point was almost unanimously positive. Amnesty International and other human rights groups condemned the White House's decision to provide the Ukrainian military with cluster bombs, warning of the threat these weapons could pose to civilians during and after the war. United States National Secretary Advisor Jake Sullivan countered the controversy by declaring that the cluster bombs the United States would be sending to Ukraine failed at far less frequent rates than the versions that the Russians had already been using in the war. The United States has a domestic law on the books that bans the production, use or transfer of cluster bombs which have a failure rate greater than 1%. Sullivan said that American cluster munitions in question fail at less than 2.5%, compared to Russian bombs that have dud rates between 30 and 40%. Nevertheless, by admitting this, he also tacitly admitted that the Biden administration was disregarding the law. Russia's defense and foreign ministry were publicly unfazed by the announcement. They instead dismissed it as an act of desperation. In accepting delivery of the cluster bombs, Ukraine promised that it would not use them on Russian territory. There were other conditions too, which we'll get into in a moment. For Ukraine, a feeling of necessity surrounds the use of cluster bombs. At the beginning of July, the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, Valery Zaluzhny, admitted that the counteroffensive in Donbass and Zaporizhia that began in June was not making the progress that he had desired. He blamed the slow pace of the operations on a lack of adequate firepower, especially artillery and air support. General Zaluzny particularly complained about the lack of adequate fighter jets to provide air support, saying that the Western planes he wanted were a generation more advanced than the planes available to him. Ukraine has long desired cluster bombs to more effectively target Russian defenses, formations of tanks and armored vehicles, and troop formations. Because cluster bombs focus their attack on a wide area, the Ukrainians would need less of them to destroy Russian assets, in comparison to the more narrowly targeted weapons Ukraine has been using. 
ammunition expenditures would decrease and accuracy would become less important. Given Ukraine's shortage of the artillery shells it desperately needs if its counteroffensive is to make the headway it wants, the delivery of American cluster bombs is a welcome one for Kyiv. A British general, Sir Richard Shiriff, NATO's former Deputy Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, mentioned that the decision had utility. Arming the Ukrainians with cluster bombs, he said, would make it easier for them to break through Russian lines. He blamed the West for failing to provide adequate firepower early enough, therefore making the use of cluster bombs necessary now. The cluster weapon in question is the dual-purposed Improved Conventional Munition DPICM. This is an artillery shell that bursts apart and drops 88 separate bomblets over the target area. The cluster shell has a dud rate of around 3%, so its delivery would violate American law. In September 2022, General Zaluzny wrote an article requesting that the United States provide Ukraine with the DPICM, which is currently being phased out in the US Armed Forces in favor of the CDAEM cluster round, which has a dud rate of 1% or less, in line with American standards first set by the Obama administration. Note that this standard is different from the law, which forbids the transfer of cluster munitions with a failure rate greater than 1%. The Ukrainian top general is now finally getting his wish. Another weapon the Ukrainians badly want is the airdropped Mark 20 Rock I-2 cluster bomb, also known as the CBU-100, which weighs about 500 pounds in total. It is a gravity bomb that, once released from the air, bursts apart into 247 separate Mark 118 bomblets that rain down over the designated target area. The target area's range can be adjusted based on the altitude that the original container is set to burst apart in. The Mark 118 bomblets are steered by fins at the back and have electrical and mechanical fuses that activate once they are released from the original CBU-100. Once the bomblet's noses hit a hard surface, the ordnance detonates. Reportedly, the Ukrainians do not want to use the Mark 20 Rock I-2 cluster bomb in its traditional way, because Ukraine already has better cluster-type weapons in its arsenal that can be delivered via HIMARS and other systems. The coming DPICM artillery shells add to this capability. Rather, the Ukrainians seem to want to dismantle the Mark 20 container and place the individual Mark 118 bomblets on drones. These bomblets are designed for maximum penetration against enemy armored assets. The shape of the design allows for puncturing of up to 190 mm of armor. The bomblets are also aerodynamically sound. These factors make them ideal candidates for drone operations against Russian armored formations. Ukraine has proven very effective in the practice of drone warfare. In May, it launched dozens of drone attacks to weaken the Russian lines in preparation for the counteroffensive it launched in Zaporizhia and around Bakhmut in June. Additionally, Ukraine has carried out drone attacks far beyond the Russian lines. Combining the drone capability with the wider area effect of a cluster bomb is something the Ukrainian military is very keen on trying, as it seeks any advantage it can find in the counteroffensive. The Mark 20's manufacturer, a company called Textron Systems, reportedly stopped making this weapon in 2016, following the United States' decision to discontinue sales of the bomb to Saudi Arabia. However, the United States has large stockpiles of the Mark 20 containers and the Mark 118 bomblets, more than enough to provide them in large numbers to the Ukrainian military. So far, the United States has not yet agreed to deliver this weapon to Ukraine. We will need to wait and see if that changes. Although neither the United States nor Ukraine joined the Convention on Cluster Munitions, the decision to use them has still created a lot of controversy among NATO members and other like-minded countries. The United States is by far its most important partner, but Ukraine still needs the support of these other nations which have signed the Convention on Cluster Munitions. These countries provide Ukraine with military and financial aid, and all of this help is needed. Therefore, Ukraine will probably want to be careful in how it uses the cluster munitions when they arrive on the battlefield. So where would the Ukrainian military use these weapons and where would it be less likely to use them? Ukraine will probably want to use its new cluster artillery shells in areas where its counteroffensive has stalled. This would be in Zaporizhia, in the drive toward the city of Tokmak. Perhaps anticipating this, Russian reports suggest that Ukrainian troops had already struck areas near Tokmak, the probable initial objective for Ukraine on the Zaporizhia front, with cluster munitions on July 11th although the Institute for the Study of War could not independently verify this. As of July 15th, the front line in Zaporizhia extends from the Dnieper, around Kamyansk, to Novopil, opposite Lyubmivka. 
all of these sectors could prove enticing targets for cluster bomb attacks, because a breakthrough in Zaporizhia Oblast would put Ukraine in position to cut the Russian land bridge to Crimea. It is a highly strategic area. Ukraine will want to affect that breakthrough any way it can, and the Russian defenses there are heavier than anywhere else on the front. This is part of why Ukraine has made such slow progress in the counteroffensive so far. If there is one area where we can probably bet to see the use of cluster bombs at the front, it would be there in Zaporizhia. Ukrainian forces may also wish to use the cluster bombs in Bakhmut, which has seen the heaviest fighting in the war, and which is another axis of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Ukraine is currently pushing towards Minkivka in the north and towards Ozaryanivka in the south. The Ukrainian units there hope to encircle Russian-occupied Bakhmut and cut the city off from supply lines further to the east. Finally, the Ukrainian military may seek to use its new cluster bombs to support special operations across the Dnieper River opposite Kherson. In deploying its new weapons, Ukraine could use them to disrupt Russian formations over a wider area than its current artillery shells do. Still, Ukraine would need to be careful that unexploded bomblets do not become de facto landmines that impede the movement of its own forces. On the other hand, the unexploded bomblets dropped on Russian lines could also protect the gains that Ukraine makes in its attacks. The area denial factor of these unexploded bombs then works against the Russians, making it harder for them to counterattack. In this way, it's possible to view the tendency toward a high dud rate as a feature of cluster bombs, rather than a bug. Cluster bombs dropped on strategic pieces of real estate like airports, approaches to river crossings, tactically important high ground and so on, act as improvised, rapidly deliverable landmines that slow down the operations of enemy forces. Every piece of ground Ukraine retakes could be protected with the unexploded bomblets of the cluster weapons it uses on Russian lines. Areas where Ukraine would more likely not want to deploy cluster bombs would be in sectors with even marginal civilian populations. Indeed, one of the terms of the deal that Ukraine made with the Biden administration was an assurance that the American-made cluster bombs would not be used in areas near where civilians are present. This could mean that the artillery batteries equipped with the cluster rounds are less likely to fire near occupied villages but in the zones between them. All wars are first and foremost political, and large numbers of civilian casualties that come as a result of Ukrainian-deployed cluster bombs would risk undermining the global support that Ukraine has managed to build since Russia's invasion. One of the many reasons why Russia has been condemned for its conduct in the conflict is through its own use of cluster bombs. In early March 2022, human rights groups accused Russia of using cluster bombs in civilian areas. One such attack wound up hitting a school in Kharkiv, the second biggest city in Ukraine. The attack killed three civilians, including a child. Although Russia has not ratified the Convention on Cluster Munitions, the attack was still considered a war crime. The move was similar to some of Russia's accused tactics in the Syrian civil war, where cluster bombs were also used, including against civilian targets. In July 2022, Amnesty International came out with a more detailed report, accusing Russia of killing hundreds of civilians in the Kharkiv area through indiscriminate shelling and the use of cluster bombs. The weapons in question were the 9N210 and the 9N235 cluster bombs and scatterable mines that eject from smaller rockets. These mines explode at timed intervals once released. Investigators from Amnesty International looked at 41 strike sites in Kharkiv that resulted in the deaths of 62 civilians and the wounding of 196 more. They said that using these weapons is tantamount to deliberately targeting civilians. This is a violation of international humanitarian law, despite Russia's not being a party to the Convention on Cluster Munitions. Russia's use of cluster bombs in Ukraine goes much further than the strikes in Kharkiv. Regions all over Ukraine have been targeted with these weapons. Russia has never denied using cluster bombs and has been rather keen to point out NATO's use of its own cluster bombs in the Balkans in 1999. Russia has been a fierce critic of the Convention on Cluster Munitions, saying that these munitions are legitimate weapons which have not been banned by international humanitarian law and play a significant role in the defense interests of Russia. It is in incidents such as these that Ukraine's desire for cluster bombs becomes more understandable. If Russia has already used cluster bombs, Ukraine naturally would see no problem with retaliating in a similar way. Despite the history of Russian cluster bomb use, Sergei Shoigu, Russia's Minister of Defense, threatened escalation, saying that Russian would use similar weapons if American cluster bombs wound up being used in the war. 
Ukraine, for its part, had also used cluster bombs prior to the Biden administration's decision to deliver more of them to the conflict. As early as 2014, Ukraine was using the Soviet-era cluster bombs it had inherited in the Donbass region against pro-Russian separatist forces, although Ukraine denied that it was doing so back then. The new American-made cluster bombs should be a much better performing round than Ukraine's previous stockpiles. General Zaluzny had been very keen on getting his hands on the DPICM. In his September 2022 interview, he stated that it is a much more effective round than the high-explosive artillery shells the United States had been delivering to Ukraine. Unlike cluster ammunition, high-explosive shells hit a single point and explode. Although these impacts create shockwaves and thousands of high-speed shell fragments, the area of effect is much smaller than a cluster bomb. Although the United States has granted Ukraine DPICM artillery rounds, it has not yet granted the Mark 20 Rock I-2 or the Mark 118 bomblets that it drops. We will need to see if that changes. The Biden administration is probably hoping that it will not need to provide these weapons and risk further alienating international allies and partners. If the DPICM artillery rounds make enough of a difference in the counteroffensive, then there is less of a need to send more cluster bombs to Ukraine and contaminate the country with the duds. That is an important consideration for Ukraine's prospects both during and after the war. Although examples of Russian cluster bomb use in the current conflict abound, the Ukrainians will need to take heed of the example Russia has set. The first delivery of American cluster bombs to Ukraine was confirmed by the Pentagon on July 13th. We must now wait and see how Ukraine exactly will use them on the battlefield and where it will do so. The answers will come shortly. Ukraine's new cluster bombs should prove more effective than the Soviet-era munitions it had been using. But more than any other weapon granted to Ukraine so far in the war, this type of munition divides Western opinion. Since securing Western support for the duration of its war with Russia remains the most important item on the strategic agenda for Ukraine, it will need to be more careful with how it uses cluster bombs than any other weapon in its arsenal. If it uses them in a reckless or less than discriminate way, it will risk undermining the Western support so vital for its war effort. The negative response of so many NATO allies to the news of the Biden administration's decision will undoubtedly provoke caution in the Ukrainian high command about how these weapons should be deployed. But what do you think? Is it a good idea to give Ukraine cluster bombs? Where would the Ukrainians use them in their offensive operations and how? Do you think they could change the course of the war? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Shelling. You might have been hearing about it a lot recently, but what is it exactly? How is it accomplished and why do you almost never hear it in reference to the US military? Shelling is typically used in reference to the employment of artillery during military conflict. Artillery itself has been in use almost since the dawn of war itself and is typically used in either an anti-fortification or anti-personnel role. In the anti-fortification role, artillery is employed to soften or destroy enemy defenses. Prior to World War II, this was perhaps the most common use of artillery thanks to the construction of large defensive works. However, as airplanes became more advanced and were able to carry heavier bomb loads, and as tanks became more sophisticated, large static defensive works and even trenches became untenable in modern combat. In the anti-personnel role, artillery is employed to inflict mass casualties on an enemy army. In ancient times, this was typically achieved with the use of many small projectiles. Though even single large projectiles such as large boulders or even ballista could be devastating against large formations of enemy troops. Today, a variety of anti-personnel artillery shells exist, ranging from high explosive to chemical rounds. Modern artillery can also be used in area denial operations and even to support troops with non-lethal aid. The use of cluster munitions that release submunition rounds can deliver everything from anti-personnel to anti-vehicle mines, and chemical rounds can deliver heavy obscuring smoke effects or even irritants or more lethal chemical or biological agents. The first true artillery were siege engines, and the first of these known to historians is a catapult developed in Syracuse around 400 BC. Before the use of gunpowder, artillery used mechanical energy to hurl large projectiles across long distances, which severely limited their effectiveness. For example, a 1st century BC Roman catapult could launch a 14.4 pound stone with 16,000 joules of kinetic energy, while a mid-19th century 12-pounder gun firing a 9-pound round would deliver a whopping 240,000 joules of kinetic energy. 
As technology improved, so did the ability to deliver bigger and bigger ammunition over longer distances, and in the 20th century, a battleship could fire 2,700 one-pound shells at an energy level of over 350 million joules. As artillery became more advanced, so too did its capabilities and the types of ammunition that could be fired from them. Today, American artillery is capable of firing a variety of projectiles, including high explosive, typically used against personnel and static targets, and filled with a high explosive filler that can cause blast damage. Personnel are further at risk of injury from shell casings and other debris from the blast, causing a deadly shower of shrapnel. High explosive anti-tank. These types of rounds are specifically geared for defeating the armor of enemy vehicles. They have traditionally been used in anti-tank artillery, guns that resemble the cannons of yesteryear more than what you might think of artillery today, and fire on a relatively flat trajectory. However, modern US smart rounds like the 155mm M982 Excalibur can be fired from traditional artillery and precisely guided onto enemy tanks from even as far away as 37 miles. These rounds use a jet of hot metal to punch through enemy armor and ensure a kill but require extreme precision to be effective. Submunition These types of rounds are designed to carry some kind of cargo inside and dispersed with the use of small explosive charges that blast the round apart at the desired target location. The cargo inside these rounds can include cluster munitions perfect for spreading smaller explosives over a wide area and doing serious damage to lightly armored vehicles, enemy artillery and personnel. Mines can also be carried and burst high over a target area to saturate the ground below and make it incredibly dangerous for the enemy to attempt to cross. Chemical These types of rounds can include chemical agents designed to be toxic, harassing or smoke producing. A toxic agent can be intended to incapacitate or outright kill enemy soldiers through poisoning, while a harassing agent is milder in nature and intended to seriously degrade the enemy's ability to fight. VX and tear gas are two types of toxic and harassing agents respectively. Smoke-producing agents are meant to generate large amounts of thick, voluminous smoke. This can provide cover for friendly infantry vehicles or even be used to block infrared signatures. Alternatively, the smoke can be fired onto enemy positions to obscure their sight and render them incapable of responding to an attack. Rocket Assisted Rocket-assisted projectiles, or RAP, are meant to greatly extend the range of artillery and can add significant reach to an already deadly weapon system, practice, or inert. These types of rounds can contain only a very low explosive such as a propelling and spotting charge used for training. The tiny spotting charge helps trainees spot where their artillery is landing but does very little actual damage on the ground. Illuminating Illumination rounds are hollow inside, carrying a small parachute and an illuminant payload. The illuminant is designed to burn brightly enough to shed light in a wide area, with a parachute helping slow its descent. While any time large amounts of artillery is used, the act is typically referred to as shelling in modern wars. The term shelling typically also includes the use of other types of ground effect weapons. Cruise and ballistic missiles both can be used to wreak massive devastation on the ground below, and much like artillery shells can be loaded with a variety of payloads to increase their effectiveness. Ground attack aircraft such as Russia's Sukhoi Su-25 are also frequently used to pound enemy positions on the ground. However, these aircraft are very vulnerable to ground fire, as they typically need to be flying low to strike their targets. This is especially true for the Russian military, given their lack of targeting pods and smart munitions. Multiple launch rocket projectors are another form of more modern artillery and consist of several launch tubes all loaded with high explosive rockets. Often referred to as rocket artillery, these are devastating weapons against enemy infantry because they can fire dozens of projectiles in very rapid succession. That means that ground impacts are happening in very quick succession, leaving enemy infantry with very little time to seek cover versus a traditional artillery barrage. While traditional or tube artillery can manipulate its launch angle and projectile velocity to fire multiple rounds which all hit the target in very rapid succession, it doesn't compare to the ability of rocket artillery to completely saturate an enemy target quickly. In essence, the term shelling refers to the widespread use of delivery systems using high explosives in rapid succession. But why will you hear it in reference to Russia's military and rarely ever in reference to the US military? That's down to two different warfighting methodologies. The Russian military is less technologically sophisticated and has a much smaller budget, thus it must rely on traditional artillery for fire support missions. Without a significant smart weapons capability, the Russian military must also rely on overwhelming force to achieve its objectives, thus requiring massive and prolonged artillery bombardments. The American military, on the other hand, while still having a robust artillery corps, is far more technologically advanced 
and has the world's largest stockpile of smart munitions. Rather than expending dozens of rounds to ensure the destruction of a high-value target, the American military can instead use a much more mobile and flexible air asset with a single smart munition to achieve the same effect. Precision means less waste and greater lethality, but it also comes with the added bonus of causing significantly less collateral damage. And that's why when you compare collateral damage caused by the Russian military action versus American military action, the difference is astronomical. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. The famous phrase from former world heavyweight champion Mike Tyson certainly applies to both sides in the war in Ukraine. Now nearly two years old, both Russia and Ukraine have learned many hard lessons during the fighting. One of them is that ammunition gets depleted quickly in a modern conflict. Both sides have suffered shortages of missiles, artillery, and other modern instruments of war. The shortage of weapons and length of the conflict has forced both sides to find creative ways to keep themselves in the fight, including by using some unconventional weapons. Let's take a look at some of these arms, which range from the archaic to the very, very strange. One of the stranger weapons seen in this conflict is a variant of the KH-101 cruise missile, which was developed in Russia during the 1990s. The first pictures of its use surfaced in 2007, and the weapon entered service with the Russian Air Force in 2012. The KH-101 is a subsonic cruise missile launched from a bomber. It has a maximum speed of Mach 0.76, and can carry conventional warheads between 400 and 450 kilograms. It can also carry nuclear warheads up to 20 kilotons, the same yield as the Fat Man bomb dropped on Nagasaki at the end of World War II. The most formidable aspect of this cruise missile is its stealthy design. The KH-101 is designed for low visibility and to have a minimal cross-section on radar. It flies at low altitudes as well, sometimes as low as 30 meters further protecting it from radar observation. The missile can hit targets to an accuracy of less than 10 meters and has a range of 3,000 kilometers. The KH-101 has good precision features, as it's capable of striking targets in motion and can change its target if need be. The KH-101's guidance system, called the Oplesk U, is equipped with electro-optical features to correct its flight path and a TV guidance system for when it descends to hit its target. At first glance, this weapon does not seem strange. Precision missiles are an important part of modern warfare. International security experts had hoped that sanctions on Russia would prevent it from getting the components needed to manufacture such missiles. For a while, it looked like this might have been the case as the intensity of Russian missile attacks on Ukrainian cities deceased. However, 2023 has proven that Russia can still manufacture its cruise missiles at scale. Ukrainian troops have adapted to Russian cruise missiles and shot down a KH-101 in January 2023 in the Venetia region. This one surprised soldiers, though, as it came with features they had not seen before. The missile had a camera resting within a circular window, which Ukrainian authorities speculated was part of its Oplesk U guidance system. The camera had three fixed lenses, capable of observing its targets at different angles. In contrast, Earlier KH-101 missiles that had been shot down and recovered had cameras that only had a single swivel lens. Ukrainian military officials claimed that this upgraded KH-101 had a guidance system more similar to the United States DS-MAC Digital Scene-Making Area Correlation, which has an internal database of relevant terrain imagery to help guide the projectile toward its target. This system can visually identify its targets to guide the projectile rather than relying on a purely mathematical framework. The DS-MAX system is placed on some versions of the Tomahawk. However, the stranger thing was the discovery that these new versions of the KH-101 could have onboard countermeasures. On one of the missile's sides, there were two columns of six small holes, which seemed capable of distributing countermeasures against threats such as chaff. X-rays taken of the missile confirmed that it had heated traps to guard against infrared targeting, Although without a significant set of surveillance cameras, it's impossible to try to counter these heat traps automatically. It is possible that a simple onboard radar warning receiver placed on the missile could trigger the chaff's deployment upon detection of pre-programmed radio frequency emissions, or the chaff could be automatically deployed on the predetermined points of vulnerability on the missile's flight trajectory. Either way, the equipment found in this wrecked KH-101 confirmed international fears that despite the sanctions, the Russian military was still capable of producing advanced cruise missiles. 
Other unusual weapons in Ukraine are far less spectacular. Attrition on both sides of the conflict has been high, with a consequent shortage of modern weapons and ammunition. This has forced both sides to look for ways to improvise. Most famously, Russia has lost over 2,500 tanks since the start of the war, and this pressure has forced it to break its Cold War relics, like the T-54 and 55, out of storage and onto the battlefield. However, some of the weapons in Ukraine are much older than this. Old doesn't necessarily mean ineffective, however. Russia and Ukraine have both made use of older anti-aircraft guns to defend their airspaces. There is a necessity behind this decision, as there is simply not enough advanced missile base ammunition to go around for modern surface-to-air missile systems. New weapons on the battlefield have also ironically made the older guns more relevant. Because drones and many new missiles fly relatively low and slow, the old flat cannon is becoming a more relevant weapon again. After all, using an expensive missile to shoot down a cheap drone is not the most economical use of resources. For example, archaic anti-aircraft guns are a good option for Ukraine to counter the Iranian-made Shahed-136 Kamikaze drones that Russia has deployed in large numbers in the conflict. Experts at the Royal United Services Institute RUSI, assessed that in countering these drones and other loitering munitions, in general, gun systems are preferred over missiles where possible. Due to much lower cost per engagement and higher availability of ammunition compared with SAMs and man pads. The RUSI staff urged Western leaders to help make these anti aircraft guns more effective. For example, the Soviet and Russian self propelled anti aircraft guns such as Shilka and Tunguska have had trouble against the Shahed and other kamikaze drones because they fly too low, but the German Flak Panzer Gepard has proven highly effective against them. Should these older weapons be fitted with radar and laser rangefinders, they could be much more effective in shooting down the Shahed 136 and other cheap, low-flying drones, without exhausting the much more precious stockpile of surface-to-air missiles. Ukraine's adoption of old-style flak cannons goes beyond defense, however. Using the flak cannon in an offensive fashion has proven equally effective. One of the more unusual uses of this type of weapon is in its tweaked use of the Soviet-era KS-19 anti-aircraft gun. This weapon was first introduced in 1947 and fires a 100 by 695 mm shell. Ukrainian troops are now mounting this gun on the back of ubiquitous civilian trucks, which allow them to be moved in and out of combat rapidly. Although old, Ukrainian troops are improvising with these guns in surprising ways. The gunners are equipping them with tablet computers and pairing these with drones. Once the drones are in the sky, they can track Russian targets on the ground. The drones then send back data to the gunners, who then fire upon them, thus adapting the anti-aircraft gun for an anti-infantry and anti-armor role. One artillerist involved in these operations, Sergeant Yevgeny Itvin, said that the process of modification was very simple. It's like a box with two antennas. You just put it on the gun, you put two antennas on the barrel, one on the edge of the barrel and the other on another side. Ukrainian forces are often paying for this KS-19 modification process with their own money, demonstrating the shortage of modern military equipment, but also their ingenuity and the relatively low cost of adapting these old anti-aircraft guns for modern purposes. According to Itvin and others, this process, which was first reported in November 2023, had already killed 1,000 Russian soldiers. This modified KS-19 gun is capable of hitting targets spread up to 328 feet apart, and it can kill dozens of enemy troops in a single blast, making good use of each shot of ammunition. Even older weapon systems have proven equally effective on the modern battlefield. One of the oldest weapons seen in use in Ukraine is the World War I-era M1910 Maxim machine gun, which had its design origins in the 1880s. The belt-fed machine gun fires the type of 7.62 by 54 mm ammunition that has been in use in Russia since 1891, meaning that there are almost limitless rounds available for it. The machine gun is also water-cooled, making it versatile and durable compared to air-cooled machine guns, which often overheat, even in winter temperatures. In theory, an M1910 machine gun can fire indefinitely as long as it has access to water and ammunition. The Maxim machine gun is also surprisingly easy to modify for modern purposes. Ukrainian soldiers have been spotted placing modern optical equipment and camouflage on it, as well as a stock and suppressor. After seeing some use in early 2022, 
the M1910 Maxim reappeared in the Battle of Bakhmut. The weapon's main strength is to protect defensive positions, and this is how Ukrainian troops have used it. In Bakhmut, Ukrainian operators used it to mow down swathes of Russian attackers in scenes which harkened back to its World War I heyday. In this 21st century version of trench warfare, defenders can mount a series of M1910 Maxim guns, a remote-controlled rig that can spin 360 degrees. During the battle, video spread on TikTok of Ukrainian troops firing four of these machine guns at the same time, with each gun's ammunition belt fed from ammunition canisters strapped to a rig. One Ukrainian soldier said of the M1910 Maxim, it only works when there is a massive attack going on. Then it really works. The M1910 is not the only old weapon that has worked for Ukrainian troops. The DP-27 Degtyaryov light machine gun is another old automatic weapon being used by some units in Ukraine's reserve forces. This weapon was introduced in 1928 and was once called Stalin's record player, on account of the drum magazine mounted on top of it. Before the war, the Ukrainian territorial defense forces were spotted with it near Kyiv. Once the invasion began, images circulated of units there defending the capital with this weapon. The DP-27 was, like many other Soviet weapons, designed to be reliable in extreme conditions, such as freezing temperatures and mud. The weapon is chambered for the ubiquitous 7.62x54mm round, and the notable Pan magazine can hold a total of 47 rounds. It is capable of firing 550 shots per minute, which is lower than other, more modern machine guns, but since the DP-27 is air-cooled, the lower rate of fire reduces the chance for barrel overheating. Unlike some troops using other older weapons in the war, Ukrainian troops using the DP-27 have not seemed to complain about the weapon and remain in good spirits with it. One video circulating on social media in March 2022 showed one of the soldiers pretending to be a DJ with it and dancing to a tune with a smile on his face. Such small gestures often help to maintain morale and basic humanity under hellish conditions. In its defense of entrenched positions, the Maxim machine gun has proven itself useful in a modern setting, and the DP-27 seems to be good enough to fulfill its intended mission. However, other weird weapons in Ukraine have only made their appearance for a true lack of better alternatives. One of these weapons is the Mosin-Nagant bolt-action rifle, which saw widespread service in the Russian Empire and later the Soviet Union from the 1890s until the end of World War II. Although the Mosin-Nagant exited active service in the late 1940s, it was still produced in Soviet factories until the 1970s. And because so many millions of these weapons were manufactured over nearly a century, they have been used during the war when the supply of modern weapons is short. In April 2023, Reuters reported that conscripts fighting in the separatist armies in the Donbass region lacked proper equipment and so were armed with the archaic Mosin-Nagant rifle. Images circulating on social media at the time also purportedly showed these troops carrying the Mosin Nagant, though Reuters could not independently verify them. In July 2022, video surfaced of a Russian company commander complaining that his men too were using the 1944 variant of the Mosin Nagant due to a shortage of equipment. A few months later, when Putin announced his partial mobilization and drafted 300,000 reservists, there were also reports that some of them were being issued the Mosin Nagant instead of modern assault rifles. Given the other equipment shortages facing these troops in particular, such as a lack of proper body armor, the Mosin Nagant's presence among some of these troops seemed consistent with what we know about Russian logistics. The Mosin Nagant rifle has a clip of five 7.62x54mm rounds. It's a bolt action rifle, meaning the operator must cycle the bolt back to eject a spent cartridge and load the next one into the chamber. Bolt-action rifles are more accurate per shot than semi-automatic rifles or fully automatic assault rifles, which is why snipers still use them. For a frontline unit, however, it's not ideal, as these weapons have too slow of a rate of fire by modern standards. The issuance of this weapon to frontline troops had many war watchers calling them cannon fodder, a fact which many of the Russian conscripts agreed with. Separatist troops from Donbass have also been seen using the World War II-era PTRS-41 anti-tank rifle. This weapon was first brought into service in 1941 and fires a 145 by 144 mm armor-piercing round. During the Battle of Stalingrad in World War II, Soviet forces often mounted these guns on rooftops and fired down at the thinner turret armor of German panzers. Eighty years later, forces from Donetsk were seen with them, 
still carrying the nearly century-old ammunition cartridges as well. The PTRS-41 is a semi-automatic weapon, with the ammunition stacked in an overlapping pattern similar to the famous M1 Garand, making for a clip that attaches to the gun. Unfortunately for the operators of the PTRS-41, this design was not done as well as the American version, and it makes the weapon prone to jamming. There are scant reports about the PTRS-41's effectiveness against modern tanks. The separatist militias fighting alongside the Russian forces in Ukraine might be using it in a more general anti-material role. This weapon would be effective against more lightly armored vehicles and supply trucks at least. Widespread reports of the use of archaic small arms within the Russian and separatist forces indicate their trouble. However, things have not always been smooth for Ukrainian forces either. Ukraine has also been forced to break decades-old small arms out of storage since modern weapons are in such short supply. Another archaic weapon in the service of Ukraine is the TT-33 pistol, which entered into use for the Soviet Union in the 1930s. Since over a million of these weapons were manufactured during its service life, they are easy to find and break out of storage when required. The TT-33 is a semi-automatic pistol that comes with an 8-round magazine chambered for a 7.62 by 25 mm round. Both Russian and Ukrainian troops have been seen carrying this weapon in the conflict. One of the more interesting videos related to its use came from Ukrainian soldiers, attempting to test the steel plates in captured Russian body armor during the summer of 2022. Although the steel plate held against the TT-33's round, the pistol demonstrated that it could put significant deformation and cracks into the metal which would fail to protect the wearer from the energy imparted by the round. As many Russian troops do not even have this level of protection with their body armor, if indeed they have body armor at all, even the TT-33's low-caliber round poses a danger to Russian troops. Although there are understandably not many reports of pistols being used in this war, the lack of proper Russian body armor means that the TT-33 will be a threat to many of the Kremlin's soldiers, especially the conscripts, in close quarters. Ukraine has also been forced to improvise and create makeshift weapons on the spot. The country benefits from having a large population of engineers who know how to bootstrap. For example, the Ukrainians have turned shotguns into grenade launchers by attaching steel cups to the end of their barrels. Once the user is ready to fire, all one needs to do is pull the pin out of a conventional grenade and then tuck the munitions handle into the cup's wall. Then the user can load a cartridge into the shotgun that has been emptied of the normal pellets. The blank round projects the cup and grenade into the air, which releases the latter's handle and sends it on its explosive course. As one might expect, this is a dangerous method to launch a grenade, but with a shortage of modern weapons and ammunition, Ukrainian forces have often needed to make do with what they can get. Another makeshift innovation from both sides in the conflict includes a modification to the RPG-7. This weapon is normally a tank or a vehicle killer and not particularly effective against infantry. Not to worry. Smart engineers amongst irregular forces have modified the RPG-7 launcher to fire 82mm mortar rounds with fragmentation warheads to spread their effects against infantry over a broader area. This method has been in use for a long time, starting even before the full-scale Russian invasion. Both forces in the earlier Donbass conflict had used the modified RPG-7 in this way. Ukraine has also used drones to give old weapons new life. For example, Ukrainian forces have modified the Soviet-era RKG-3 anti-tank grenade to be used with drones. The drones drop these grenades on the turret of a tank where the armor is thinnest. The RKG-3, which first entered Soviet service in the early 1950s, was originally designed with a drogue parachute, which opened up after a soldier threw it. This design was meant to help guide the munition onto the top of an enemy tank. However, this method is not ideal for drone use so Ukrainian engineers have removed the parachutes and added 3D-printed fins in their place. The fins stabilize the munition in its descent while also allowing it to fall faster than the parachute design did. The total cost for using the RKG-3 grenade in this new way is less than $100 per shot, making it an efficient weapon, especially given the vulnerabilities of Russian tanks if their turrets are struck. Similarly, Ukraine has requested that the United States send over the CBU-100 airdropped cluster bomb. The Ukrainians do not desire to drop the bomb from the sky so much as to separate its canister and drop the separate cluster bomblets on top of Russian armored assets via drones. Thus far, Washington has not granted the request. Necessity is the mother of invention. 
and war is the ultimate necessity. Whether it is through unusual high-tech weapons or putting ancient weapons to new uses, or being forced to use antiques for lack of better substitutes, the war in Ukraine has forced both sides to innovate and adapt. As the war now drags on into its third year, what other inventions, innovations, and crude adaptations do you think both sides will employ as depletion of modern weapons further kicks in? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, make sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons for more military analysis from military experts. Putin is a master manipulator. He's known for making statements such as claiming that Russia is not responsible for the war in Ukraine and suggesting that both countries are sharing in the tragedy and the Russian public is buying it. What other lies is he spreading and how is he managing to persuade more than 145 million Russian citizens to buy into his claims? One of the biggest lies Putin is guilty of is the way he plays fast and loose with the term genocide, especially when it comes to describing the Ukrainian military operations that took place in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, collectively known as the Donbass, leading up to the invasion. According to Putin, the primary objective of the war in Ukraine has always been the demilitarization and denazification of the Ukrainian government. Ultimately, to put a stop to the genocide, he claims Kyiv has been carrying out against the Russian-speaking population of the Donbass. But is a genocide actually happening? According to the UN, genocide is defined as acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnic, racial or religious group. As such, this definition includes not only mass murder but the destruction of a specific population's way of life. Examples of this include permanently separating young children from their parents and making attempts to stop new members from being born into the population. To be clear, both Ukrainian and pro-Russian forces were guilty at the time of inflicting collateral damage, namely deaths or injuries from reckless, accidental or indiscriminate firing. But it's imperative to make a clear distinction here between collateral damage resulting from armed conflict and genocide, and this is where Putin strays from the truth. Starting in 2014, the Ukrainian army has been in constant conflict with Russian-backed separatists in the Donbass, ever since Russian-backed rebels seized part of the region and declared it the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. Nearly 14,000 people were killed in the skirmish, including soldiers, civilians and rebel fighters. A ceasefire was promptly signed in 2015 in the Belarusian capital of Minsk, but sporadic gunfire and shelling continued to disrupt the region for the next seven years, until February 2022, when Russian troops moved over the border, effectively kicking off Putin's peacekeeping operation, which has since spread across most of Ukraine. To strengthen his argument for war and prior to actually entering Ukraine, Russia's investigative committee filed a lawsuit with the European Court of Human Rights back in 2021, concerning alleged war crimes committed by the Ukrainian army and certain nationalist battalions. The lawsuit claimed that members of the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics discovered a mass grave containing 292 bodies, victims of Putin's supposed genocide. The committee also claimed that Ukraine and the United States were working together to develop biological and chemical weapons they intended to use against separatist forces in the Donbass. Ultimately, no credible evidence to back these claims was presented, only vague references to other mass graves and ongoing attacks directed at Russian-speaking civilians. But the Russians haven't been the only ones looking to our international legal system for assistance. Seven months after the invasion, on September 27, 2023, representatives from Kyiv effectively turned the table on Putin and urged judges at the International Court of Justice, also known as the ICJ or World Court, to go against objections put forth by the Kremlin and hear Kyiv's testimony that Moscow violated international law when they claimed the 2022 invasion was carried out to stop an alleged genocide. As one of the six principal organs of the United Nations, the ICJ is responsible for settling disputes between states in accordance with international law and gives advisory opinions on international legal issues. Claiming that Russia violated international law as outlined in the 1948 Genocide Convention, representatives from Kyiv have continued to seek the ICJ's protection, while Russia, on the other hand, has so far ignored the ICJ's preliminary hearing, handed down in March of 2022, which ordered a stop to all military actions. The World Court, however, has no way of enforcing this ruling. Experts do say, though, that a full ruling in Ukraine's favor, that is, 
If the ICJ agrees that Russia essentially carried out a false flag operation and launched their invasion under the guise of preventing further genocide, this could result in future financial compensation for Ukraine. But Putin crying genocide isn't the biggest lie he's told to justify going to war with Ukraine. During the ongoing action at the World Court, the Kremlin actually accused Zelensky, the grandson of a Holocaust survivor, of being a Nazi. It should probably be noted here that Zelensky's five-year term as president began in 2019, with a landslide major victory over 39 other candidates, and that his Servant of the People party went on to win 254 seats in the 450-seat chamber, becoming the first majority government in the history of the modern Ukrainian state. It probably also would not hurt to mention that Ukraine today maintains a vibrant democracy and, for a brief period, was the only state outside of Israel to have both a Jewish head of state and a Jewish head of government. Not to mention that Zelensky himself is the grandson of a Holocaust survivor and was raised in a Jewish family. While Putin is definitely the one responsible for making these verifiably false claims of genocide and neo-Nazism, unfortunately, in some ways Ukraine's own government has helped to spread them by the adoption of a new state language law that requires Ukrainian to be used in most aspects of public life. That may sound crazy, but allow us to explain. Article 25 of the new law, which was actually put in place by former President Petro Poroshenko back in 2019 as he was leaving office, requires that print media outlets registered in Ukraine publish in Ukrainian, that publications in other languages be accompanied by an equivalent Ukrainian version, and that at least half of all content provided by distribution outlets, such as newsstands, be in Ukrainian. There are some exceptions carved out for certain languages like English and official EU languages, but not for Russian. So how does this further Putin's lies? The implementation of these new laws has been, to varying degrees, upsetting for Ukraine's Russian-speaking population, and some see this as real-world evidence that helps support Putin's more outlandish claims. Historians have pointed out, however, that Russian speakers currently living in Ukraine have far more freedom than they could expect were they living in Russia, where, among manifestations of state oppression, any form of political dissent is swiftly suppressed. This all makes the labeling Zelensky and his party as Nazis quite the stretch, especially when we take into consideration Putin's recent anti-Semitic rant on Russian television. Western powers, Putin said, only installed Zelensky as the president of modern Ukraine to cover up the current glorification of Nazism that's happening there. During his rant, Putin also made several arguably derogatory references to Zelensky's Jewish heritage, a somewhat regular occurrence since the launch of the invasion. But Ukraine's state language law isn't the only self-imposed problem they're facing. Complicating the entire issue significantly, however, and only serving to amplify Putin's cries of Nazism within the Ukrainian government, has been the ongoing controversy surrounding Ukraine's use of the so-called Azov Battalion. While the Azov Battalion does represent only a tiny fraction of Ukraine's defense forces, around 900 combatants, members of the battalion have been known to wear black fatigues, display Nazi tattoos, and go into battle with hand-drawn swastikas on their helmets. Further complicating the matter, largely due to their success in battle, the battalion was officially absorbed into the Ukrainian National Guard in November of 2014. Former President Poroshenko even called them some of Ukraine's best warriors and best volunteers. Coming to their own defense, the battalion insisted that the symbol they fought under is simply an N and an I, which stands for National Idea, while in actuality the symbol is clearly a tilted version of the Wolfsangel, borrowed from the 3rd Reich's 2nd SS Panzer Division Das Reich. The Azov Battalion's choice of insignia, unfortunately, is not the most controversial thing about them. They have been accused by no less than the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights of engaging in various war crimes, including torture, looting, and unlawful detention of civilians. In the wake of these and other disturbing accusations, they were removed from serving on the front lines in August 2015, while ongoing concerns in the United States prompted House Democrats to petition for the battalion to be classified as a foreign terrorist organization. Clearly, anything and everything to do with the Azov Battalion looks bad for Ukraine, but the organization's existence and contribution to the fight against Russian separatists, which ended years prior to the Russian invasion, doesn't justify a single one of Putin's claims, especially those related to Ukraine's right to exist at all as an independent country. But we haven't even gotten to some of Putin's biggest lies of all yet. During his address to the nation back in February 2022, 
Putin explicitly denied the validity of Ukraine's long-established statehood, claiming that modern Ukraine is actually a Soviet republic that was carved from Russian land by Vladimir Lenin, then supplemented with more land by Joseph Stalin following the Second World War. After a referendum in 1991, during which 92.3% of voters said they prefer Ukraine to be independent rather than remaining tied to the collapsing Soviet Union, the country achieved its independence, a breakup Putin took poorly and would much later describe as worse than a mistake. According to many Western analysts, however, Putin's revisionist history of Ukraine is an obvious mischaracterization, if not an outright lie, intended solely to justify his more recent aggressive actions. Many Ukrainians, too, have been happy to point out that Kyiv, with its own distinct language and customs, was founded hundreds of years before Moscow, and that a strong sense of Ukrainian nationalism has been alive and well for at least the last century. A sense that has only been inflamed by Putin's attempt to delegitimize their claim as a sovereign nation. In fact, the majority of Ukrainians have been less than enchanted with Russia for some time now, at least according to a public opinion survey conducted in November of 2021. According to the survey, which included all of Ukraine save for the occupied territories of Crimea, Donetsk and Luhansk, 58% of Ukrainians stated that they would rather join an international economic union with the EU if they could only join one, compared to just 21% who were in favor of joining a customs union with Russia, Belarus and Kazakhstan. And if a referendum were held on potentially joining NATO, the majority of Ukrainians also stated they would opt to join. Ultimately, it looks as though Putin's fiery State of the Nation address, along with his other more recent, yet less intelligible tirades, may have failed to convince Ukrainians of the benefits of Moscow's patronage, and instead revealed the Russian president to a broader international community as the bully many of Russia's neighboring nations have already come to know. Even more recently, the Kremlin, in an act of seeming desperation, perhaps frustrated by Ukraine's hesitancy to come back into the fold, appears to have adopted the age-old strategy of blame it on the nukes. During a Geneva conference on disarmament in March of 2022, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov claimed that Ukraine had been seeking to acquire nuclear weapons, and that this was a real danger to neighboring countries, as well as a threat to international security that required Russia to respond. This argument appears to be at best quite thin, especially given that Ukraine was once the third largest nuclear power in the world, but instead opted for total denuclearization. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, thousands of nuclear arms were left behind by Moscow, but instead of holding on to their impressive stockpile, Ukraine made the decision to go nuke-free, and in exchange for their kind consideration of global nuclear safety, with the signing of the Budapest Memorandum in 1994, the US, UK and Russia all agreed to guarantee Ukraine's security. However, now that they are under attack, it seems to be up to the international community, especially the signers of the Budapest Memorandum, to keep Ukraine from regretting that decision. In times like these, one could argue, it's important to keep your friends close. Which could be why, after they'd been asking for months, President Biden finally decided to supply Ukraine with long-range Army Tactical Missile Systems, or ATAC-Ms. Fired from a mobile launcher, a missile from an ATAC-Ms can hit a target up to 300 kilometers away, which should allow Ukrainian forces to strike far behind the front lines. An invaluable advantage as winter approaches and troop movements become increasingly difficult. With a limited stockpile of their own, though, and mounting concerns that Russia might go on to accuse Washington of purposefully escalating the conflict, the US held out on handing over these highly valuable weapon systems for as long as it could. As part of the deal, though, Ukraine had to promise not to launch attacks on Russian territory, leaving potential targets for the new missile systems limited to command headquarters, weapons depots, railways and other supply networks inside Ukraine. With casualties mounting on both sides and the overall advantage shifting back and forth, it's certainly been a long half year for Ukrainians and Russians alike. So we need to ask, how did we get here? Long ago, back in December of 2021, when 100,000 Russian troops were merely advancing toward the Ukrainian border, Putin sent the United States a list of demands that would absolutely need to be met in order to defuse the situation. Among them was a binding agreement that Ukraine would never be allowed to become a member of NATO. He also wanted all NATO troops and weapons removed from the 14 Eastern European countries that had joined the alliance since 1997. Ultimately, his demands were not met. But it could certainly also be said that Putin's long, distrustful history with NATO 
is partially responsible for the situation we're in now. There seems to be a lingering belief in Moscow that the West tricked the former Soviet Union by breaking promises made in 1989 and 1990 at the end of the Cold War, prompting Putin to accuse the West of going back on its assurances that NATO would not expand to the East, ultimately shattering this alleged agreement. The agreement Putin is referring to was largely based on verbal commitments made by former US Secretary of State James Baker, serving under former President George H.W. Bush, as well as a treaty signed on September 12, 1990, that outlined restrictions on NATO troop operations in the territory that makes up former East Germany. Putin has claimed that Secretary Baker, in a discussion on February 9, 1990, with infamous Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, promised that if Russia accepted Germany's unification, NATO would not expand to the east. The final agreement, however, that was actually signed by Russia and the US later that year in September, only applied to Germany, and stated only that the NATO troops would be allowed to cross the old Cold War line marked by East Germany, and only at the discretion of the German government. Six years later, in 1997, when it came to sign the NATO-Russia Founding Act, a treaty intended to finally establish a relationship between the alliance and Russia, Russia's Foreign Minister Yevgeny Primakov again raised the issue of Secretary Baker's empty promises. It didn't help matters either that despite Russia presenting itself throughout the process as a potential NATO member, the US never saw this as a reality but only a fantasy. Washington concluded without directly saying so that had the potential to paralyze the alliance. At the time, Russia's economy and political landscape were in a shambles, which led their wavering openness to NATO's expansion to teeter back and forth, depending largely on the level of financial support provided by the US or Germany. Monetary contributions that typically went missing as soon as they were transferred, but neither Russia, the US nor Germany ever described as bribes. In the decades to follow, Putin has claimed that the West has continued to ignore Russia's adamant demands that NATO 1. not extend their reach to Ukraine or any other ex-Soviet nation, 2. not deploy any offensive weapons near Russia, and 3. scale back its overall presence in Eastern Europe. And Putin, at least in terms of NATO's ongoing expansion, isn't wrong. Currently, there are American and British military advisors serving in Ukraine, there are US missile defense systems located in both Poland and Romania, and NATO troops continue to conduct exercises in the former Soviet Union countries of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Putin has said a great many things, making it difficult to discern what might be anything other than fiery gibberish, but he did warn the West that if his demands were ignored, he would consider it a violation of their obligation to ensure the security of all nations. He did warn that if Ukraine moved to join NATO, he would grow deeply concerned about the possibility of Ukraine mobilizing to take back control of the Russian-annexed Crimean Peninsula, as well as regions in the east controlled by Russia-backed separatists. Putin also claimed, however, that the US was asking Ukraine to contain Russia and draw the country into a military conflict, which would then force its European allies to respond, primarily through sanctions. And if that didn't work, the US would try to tempt Ukraine into joining NATO, so it could deploy offensive weapons near the Russian border. Then the US would encourage Ukrainian nationalists to forcefully reclaim the Crimea and rebel-held regions in the east, giving the Kremlin no choice but to defend itself. It's clear that we're now living in an age where misinformation can be weaponized, and that purposefully generating and spreading false or misleading information can not only harm individuals but ruin companies, disrupt economies, destabilize nations, and even lead to an all-out war. Putin's continued efforts to mislead both the Russian people and wider international community have resulted in a war in Ukraine. But as time goes on, and his claims become more and more untethered from reality, perhaps a time will come when even the most pro-Putin supporter will be left to wonder whether the Russian president is telling them the whole truth. But what do you think? How harmful are Putin's lies? And how long will he manage to keep the Russian public fooled? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Soldiers on both sides have been taken prisoner since the start of Russia's ill-fated invasion of Ukraine. Rumors of abuses of captives by both countries have fueled outrage and added to a litany of reports of Russian war crimes. But how true are these rumors? What really happens to prisoners of war in the Russia-Ukraine war? With winter squarely here, bitter fighting between the Russian and Ukrainian armies has punctuated an otherwise stagnant phase of battle, while both sides re-equip, rest, and repair for the resumption of large-scale hostilities in the months to come. One phenomenon continues to characterize the fighting. Through it all, 
Russia's untrained conscripts are surrendering, defecting, and being captured, sometimes individually, sometimes by the dozens, sometimes by the hundreds. Plenty of Ukrainian soldiers have been taken prisoner too. So what happens to them when they do? In today's video, we will take you through this process, delving into actual living conditions on both sides and the likelihood of being swapped in a prisoner exchange. International law governs the treatment of prisoners during wartime. At least, it does in theory when fighting powers actually choose to respect it. But, spoiler alert, Putin couldn't care less about those. The history of wartime imprisonment goes back millennia. But it wasn't until the mid-19th century when people really started internalizing the horrors of industrialized warfare that they started to do something about it. In the 1860s, the Red Cross was founded in Geneva, Switzerland, and with it came the first codified international treaty articulating the rights of sick and wounded soldiers on the battlefield. In the aftermath of World War I, delegates once again met in Geneva to expand the rules for protecting all types of prisoners of war POWs, having internalized their nightmarish experience in the twilight of that total war. They codified these lessons at a 1929 conference, later revisiting the agreement at another Geneva Convention in the wake of the horrors enacted during World War II. This updated treaty was signed and ratified by 196 countries, and today the very term, Geneva Convention, has become synonymous for the policies, protocols, and ethical standards governing the treatment of civilian and military POWs and other non-combatants during wartime. These include the right to humane treatment regardless of race, religion, sex, or color, protection for civilian aid workers, and the right to adequate accommodation and medical care. Additionally, the laws prohibit willful execution, torture, mutilation, hostage-taking, and the unlawful and wanton destruction of property when it is not militarily justified. On paper, the Geneva Conventions signaled a monumental global effort to limit war's cruelty and unnecessary destructiveness. This falls within the historical Western tradition dating back to Roman times to try and restrain human violence by promoting an understanding of what some have called the just war theory and the laws of war, of which there are two general types. Laws governing the reasons states to go to war against one another, like self-defense, and the laws governing conduct during war itself, of which the four Geneva Conventions constitute the central pillars. But war is innately cruel and destructive, and in practice nations and their soldiers regularly cast aside aspirations of waging a just war and breach the Geneva Conventions in the heat of battle. Both Russia and Ukraine count themselves as parties to the four Geneva Conventions. Inarguably, Russia finds itself among the nations who breach them in pursuit of its victory, but arguably, so too does Ukraine. Russian war crimes have proliferated so much to this point they are too numerous to review in any real detail here. Suffice it to say that as Ukraine has peeled back the roots of Russian occupation in its cities, atrocities have surfaced in kind. According to experts, these fall under three major categories – crimes of aggression, war crimes, and even genocide. Umbrella terms for things like shelling civilian targets, using banned weapons, stealing and looting, and killing aid workers. Cities like Bucha and Irpin succumb to the worst of these atrocities, with exhumations of mass graves hinting at senseless massacres, torture, mutilation, and other outlawed acts at the hands of brutal Russian invaders. These have been repeated in both large and small scale in other Ukrainian cities for the duration of the war. By August 2022, Ukraine had already leveled over 15,000 alleged war crimes at Russia. There is evidence that a limited number of Ukrainian soldiers have killed Russian prisoners in retribution for terrible war crimes like these. Given the widespread destruction of their home, family, and very way of life, such reprisals are almost understandable, despite their illegality. They are also often misunderstood. Sometimes, as in a recent case where a Russian prisoner unexpectedly opened fire on his Ukrainian captors, a dozen Russian prisoners forfeited their right to fair treatment because of the actions of one renegade individual. All 12 were killed in the ensuing firefight. Luckily, despite Russia's outraged claims of foul play, body cam footage corroborated Ukrainian assertions of Russian guilt. Earlier in the war, over 40 Ukrainian prisoners were killed in an attack on Russian prison barracks in Russian-occupied Donetsk. Russia blamed the attack on an errant Ukrainian HIMARS rocket. Ukraine claimed Russia deliberately destroyed the prison to hide the fact that the men held there had been tortured and murdered in a barbaric war crime. Despite humanity's best efforts, 
war crimes and state-on-state -state violence continue to go together like butter and bread. Accusations and counter-accusations between Ukraine and Russia will continue indefinitely. Given the fast-paced and highly volatile nature of the conflict, clarity and closure may only come when the dust settles. Maybe not at all. But on the whole, the balance sheet for abiding the Geneva Convention leans unquestionably towards Ukraine. So what exactly happens to soldiers after they've been taken prisoner by the enemy? While it's almost impossible to know just how many prisoners of war there have been so far, as neither side has divulged this information, the likeliest estimates place the number in the thousands on both sides, something that seems to be confirmed by the 1,100 confirmed Ukrainian POW trial cases opened by Russia in August. Ukrainian armed forces initially suffered huge setbacks, most notably the surrender of the remnants of the Azov Battalion, after their eight-day stand at Mariupol. But Russian POWs have also been crowding Ukrainian prisons since their withdrawal from Kyiv. What happens when they are taken prisoner? What is the process of surrender? The horrific experience of a Russian prisoner captured near Mykolaiv on the Black Sea in March and released as part of a prisoner exchange back in mid-April of 2022 is quite illustrative. Sustaining a bullet injury to the hand and surrounded by Ukrainian forces during his first firefight, the 21-year-old soldier anonymously named Anton in the report referenced the overwhelming sense of fear and dread he felt when he knew he had to surrender. The Siberian native spent a grueling 45 days in Ukrainian captivity, a period in which he came to loathe and regret his Russian military service. Having come to Russian annexed Crimea on a one-week December 2021 training course, he was catapulted into Russia's full-scale February invasion with, in his own words, practically no military training. He and his fellow soldiers had not even entertained the possibility of invading Ukraine at the time, revealing the scale of disillusionment and lack of transparency between Russia's high command and its soldiers on the ground. He was hit and captured just a week into his unit's Ukrainian foray. His imprisonment seemed to match the most common outcome. First, Ukrainian forces put a bag over his head to preserve their own operational security. Then, they loaded Anton up into a vehicle and drove him to an undisclosed urban location where he began his life in captivity. Anton was never physically beaten or assaulted, but he did speak of the constant stream of mental torment he endured at the hands of his Ukrainian guards, who constantly told him that Russia is finished, that we belong to the bottom of society, even issuing threats to starve him. His experience, surrounded and surrender, bag overhead, driven to nondescript prison, questioned and processed for detention, seems to fit a general pattern. If there is one truism of the war, is that Ukraine has demonstrated a penchant for psychological operations. From the beginning, prisoners like Anton have been filmed answering questions in viral videos that have flooded social media. Staged or not, these exchanges reinforce the rampant unpreparedness of Russian forces for long-term, large-scale fighting and the cognitive dissonance between on-the-ground expectations and experiences and their representations in Russian propaganda. Filming emotional conversations between captured soldiers and their loved ones further emphasizes these themes, and even though some have called the practice into question for breaching Geneva Convention policies of non-intimidation, it has been a useful tactic for Ukraine in the ongoing information war. So what was life in the detention center like? Aggressive rhetoric aside, Anton claimed that most guards were peaceful and calm and exercised restraint towards him. The biggest issue he faced in captivity wasn't bullying or starvation, but boredom. This tends to be the historical norm, at least for prisoners safe from physical assault, bullying and torture. Ukraine has transformed several urban buildings into makeshift detention centers to accommodate the growing influx of Russian POWs. One video reveals a row of Russian prisoners wearing blue prison suits and orange gloves to stave off the cold. Some sport war wounds and scars from prior engagements that have yet to heal. Each detainment center can accommodate several hundred men. If we were lucky, Anton noted, we would be given something random to read. Sometimes they let us watch Ukrainian propaganda on television. At one detention center, prisoners are allowed to watch up to two hours of television each day, almost all of it flavored with pro-Ukrainian messaging. Sometimes this has its desired effect. I don't understand anything, one Russian POW told a foreign correspondent. The Russian authorities were telling us one thing, and here I hear the opposite. I try to compare it, but nothing is clear. Most days we would just stare at the walls in front of us, Anton concluded. A far better outcome than befalls most Ukrainian prisoners, many of whom are regularly sent to former Russian penal colonies and report torture, intimidation, inhumane conditions, no communication with the outside world, and cases of outright murder upon their return. In a recent eye-opening report of its human rights monitoring mission in Ukraine, 
members of the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights confirmed evidence of widespread torture and ill treatment, the vast majority of it on the Russian side, after confidentially interviewing 159 POWs from Russian captivity and 175 POWs held by Ukraine. The report is incredibly insightful, even at this stage of the war. It alleges serious and gross violations committed by Russian forces or affiliated armed groups upon capture of Ukrainian service persons, providing evidence of execution during questioning, instances where Russian soldiers forced Ukrainians with broken legs to crawl 500 meters to safety before filming them and posting videos online, and using prisoners as hostages to draw out Ukrainian units near Bakhmut. Some prisoners perished in Russian detention facilities from a lack of basic medical assistance. But importantly, the majority did not complain about physical violence upon capture, even if they were subsequently beaten or threatened after. The two biggest complaints among Ukrainian service members' discomfort in transit to detention facilities, with plenty of allusions to duct tape tightly applied on eyes, tightly bound limbs, overcrowded buses, and lack of water and toilets, and the pillaging of personal belongings including money, credit cards, jewelry, clothes, watches, and other items while interned at improvised prisons and penal colonies in Russia and in Russian-occupied Ukrainian territory, the vast majority of interviewed Ukrainian POWs were held in overcrowded cells lacking basic sanitation, refused exercise or entertainment, and given undercooked or rotten food, including porridge or spaghetti, with sand or small rocks in it, and water with an unpleasant odor and insects in it. Hunger and privation were common. I was hungry all the time, one prisoner recalled echoing the desperation and extremes suffered by American prisoners of Japan in the Pacific during World War II. All my thoughts, even about my family, would come to food. With such poor food, intestinal infections and sickness often spread. Prisoners almost inevitably lose weight, some almost a quarter of their body weight. Left to tend war wounds and mental trauma, images from these Ukrainian detention centers show beds and blankets, decently heated rooms, good treatment, and instances where they could call family. Ukrainian prisoners paint mental pictures of overcrowded cells, denial of walks, basic self-care, and hygiene, being forced to sing Russian patriotic songs and slogans, coercive interrogations and torture, including beatings by hand or wooden batons, kicks, stabbing, strangling, burning, mock executions, sexual violence, dog attacks, stress positions, cold exposure, and even electric shocks. If this wasn't extreme enough, others reported captors shoving lit cigarettes in victims' noses, applying tourniquets for pain, and pulling ropes tied to genitalia to elicit sensitive information. Ironically, Russia continues to deny its maltreatment of Ukrainian POWs, even as it refuses the UN human rights mission in Ukraine access to detained prisoners. What about prisoner exchanges? Are Russia and Ukraine swapping POWs? Nobody, especially the Ukrainians, want to remain imprisoned, and there is hope for an exit. Prisoner swaps and exchanges, another historical hallmark of warfare, have featured prominently in this war as both sides strive to restore lost troops to their roles. They seem to be growing in frequency and scale. Around 1,500 Ukrainian prisoners have already allegedly been released from Russian captivity since the start of the war, sometimes by the dozens, sometimes by the hundreds. Exchanges are mutual agreements between Russian and Ukrainian officials, but they are far from indications of growing dialogue or negotiations for peace. Little is known about them but Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has indicated that the swaps sometimes involve outside adjudication from third-party states and always demand intense preparation and haggling. Zelensky has vowed the exchange of prisoners would continue until the last Ukrainian has been freed. All released prisoners are subject to a barrage of questioning once they return to their native country. They all retain emotional and physical burdens from their captivity. Most will reckon with these wounds for the rest of their lives. With more and more prisoners being released from captivity, the world will continue amassing evidence of the conditions endured by prisoners on both sides. Such evidence will assist future human rights lawyers and international tribunals in bringing justice, whatever that looks like, to the victims of inhumane treatment. But things are unlikely to change until the war finally ends. For the foreseeable future, becoming a POW in Ukraine will most likely follow the same predictable pattern, admittedly with some outliners. Becoming a captive POW in Russia, on the other hand, will be a wildly variable experience. Barring an end to the war in Ukraine's favor, a prisoner exchange is the best outcome for all parties, one that remains as unpredictable as ever. But what do you think? After the Russia-Ukraine war is over, should both countries be sanctioned equally for their maltreatment of POWs? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. 
Ukraine is taking the fight to Russia in Africa. Recently, the Ukrainian-Russian war seemingly extended its battleground to the African continent. While Russian presence in Africa is not new and has been steadily growing through the private military company Wagner Group in the past months, Ukrainian forces have been identified confronting this Russian-backed group in Sudan. Reports talk about an intense urban warfare scene between Ukrainian special forces and Wagner Group troops. Ukrainian soldiers have been spotted maneuvering in a dense area in Sudan. There is evidence of an ongoing effort to slowly take out Wagner Group forces months after their leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, was presumed dead following a plane crash. That flight was heading to Moscow from the African continent. What in the world is really going on here? Is Ukraine attempting to confront Russia in Africa? What precisely is the Wagner Group's purpose on this continent? Let's find out. The Wagner Group, a Russian military company, PMC, plays a significant role in Russia's foreign policy. Established by businessman Yevgeny Prigozhin, formerly known as Putin's chef, due to his role as a CEO of a catering company which served the Kremlin, the group emerged during Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014 and has since operated in Syria, Ukraine and African countries. It operates as a complex network of businesses and mercenary groups closely tied to the Russian military and intelligence community. Despite being illegal under Russian law, the Kremlin employs Wagner to advance its foreign policy goals. The group has expanded globally, engaging in conflicts and controlling mining sites in Africa to access valuable resources. In recent years, Wagner's operations have gained more attention, raising concerns about global security implications. Over the past decade, the Wagner Group has established strong ties with several African governments, including operations in countries such as the Central African Republic CAR, Libya, Mali, Sudan and Mozambique. In Sudan, the group has been involved in training, protecting officials and engaging in mining operations, while in Mozambique, it supported the army in its fight against Islamist insurgents. Also, Wagner's interest in Mali could be linked to its abundant gold reserves and the group has pursued commercial activities in all the countries where it operates. A key resource which, if sent back to the motherland, would greatly support the current and difficult war efforts. Since Wagner began working in Mali, civilian casualties have increased by more than 270%. A UN report released in May described how Malian soldiers, overseen by Wagner fighters, killed around 500, mostly unarmed civilians, in a village in the Mopti region over five days in March 2022. Particularly in Sudan, Wagner has been involved in training as well as the protection of officials and mining sites. The US Treasury says the Wagner Group has conducted paramilitary operations, support for preserving authoritarian regimes and exploitation of natural resources. In 2018, they had about 100 men actively training Sudanese military forces and the relationship has grown from there. The operations of the group in Sudan continued even after the April 2009 coup d'etat that ousted al-Bashir from power. They then supported the 2021 military coup, which brought in a government more interested in strengthening ties with Russia. In September, an anonymous source revealed to CNN that a non-Sudanese military was behind a series of drone attacks against the Rapid Support Forces, RSF, a paramilitary force in Sudan, suggesting the involvement of Ukrainian special forces. These attacks began just two days after the Wagner Group deployed armed trucks to an RSF garrison at al zarug southwest Sudan. As for the Wagner Group, they have firmly maintained a presence in Sudan since 2017, strategically extending their reach across the continent. In April, the late founder Yevgeny Prigozhin audaciously claimed that not a single Wagner PMC fighter had set foot in Sudan for over two years. However, mounting evidence has revealed Wagner's complicity in arming the RSF with missiles, further fueling their relentless war against the Sudanese armed forces. Even more, footage from July 2022 appears to vividly capture mercenaries training Sudanese forces in daring parachute landing exercises. The Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime GTOC, assessed in April that Wagner relentlessly sought both influence and material gain in Sudan. It is boldly believed that the primary objective of the Russians in Sudan is not merely to protect Khartoum's political power, but rather to lavishly exploit the country's abundant mineral resources. In fact, Russia has forged trade deals in the past to mine gold in Sudan. In December 2022, civilian groups in Sudan that had long been sidelined by a 2021 coup boldly signed an initial deal with the military to ignite a new two-year political transition 
and appoint a fresh civilian government. However, on April 5, 2023, the final signing of the deal was delayed for a second time due to contentious disputes over the army's subordination to civilian oversight in the new administration, as well as the integration of the RSF into the armed forces. This volatile environment has strained the relationship between de facto President Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and his deputy, RSF military leader Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, ultimately igniting a fierce conflict as RSF personnel were deployed into various roles across Sudan. Both sides boldly accused each other of instigating the conflict in 2023 and have shown little willingness to engage in negotiations. Calls for surrender have been boldly echoed by both parties, further complicating the already tense situation. The region remains of paramount geopolitical importance, and among Western allies, growing concern is palpable about the potential establishment of a Russian base on the east coast of the Red Sea. Some military leaders have shown receptiveness to this idea, raising further concerns. There have also been reports of African individuals fighting alongside the Wagner Group in Ukraine, revealing the group's connections to multiple African governments and its operations in at least eight African nations. Reuters has traced the stories of three African men who traveled to Russia with hopes of advancement but found themselves embroiled in the battlefields of Ukraine, fighting for Wagner. These individuals were among the tens of thousands of Russian convicts who chose to serve in Ukraine in exchange for a pardon. Despite internal unrest within the Wagner Group and Russia, the approximately 6,000 Wagner Group forces stationed in Africa have continued their operations with minimal changes, except for rumors of movement in Libya. The group's presence in Africa has been seen as a valuable instrument of Russian foreign policy, allowing it to gain significant influence at relatively low costs. The close relationship between Wagner and the Russian state has made it difficult to unravel their activities in Africa, raising concerns about the group's impact on the continent. This has far-reaching implications for global security, as evidenced by the UK's designation of Wagner as a terrorist organization under the Terrorism Act 2000. This decision underscores the gravity of Wagner's actions, particularly in Ukraine, and highlights the potential threat the group poses to global security. Wagner's involvement in conflicts and its ties to autocratic rulers in countries like Mali, the Central African Republic, and Sudan have raised concerns about its impact on global stability and security. The multifaceted operations of the group in Africa, including covert military activities, mining ventures, and arms procurement, reflect a complex interplay of geopolitical ambitions, economic interests, and power struggles, all of which shape Russia's global standing and internal politics. Wagner's profit-oriented activities have aligned with Russia's foreign policy objectives, enabling the group to expand its influence in West and Central Africa by filling security voids and capitalizing on anti-French sentiment rooted in anti-colonialism and criticism of France's historical support for dictatorial regimes. The Wagner Group's presence on the African continent is seen as a destabilizing force for any country that allows for the deployment of the group's resources into their sovereign territory. The US Treasury Department has accused Wagner of committing widespread human rights abuses and appropriating natural resources. The statement also accused Wagner of supplying Sudan's rapid support forces with missiles for its conflict with the Sudanese army. The Wagner Group was founded by Dmitry Utkin, a former lieutenant colonel in the Russian military intelligence agency. In 2021, United Nations experts mentioned systemic and grave human rights and international humanitarian law violations, including arbitrary detention, torture, disappearances, and summary execution committed by personnel of the Wagner Group in the Central African Republic. The most recent altercation in Sudan between Wagner and Ukraine, revealed in the available footage, is believed to reveal classified operations conducted by specialized units within Ukraine's Ministry of Defense's main intelligence directorate. These operations exemplify Ukraine's unwavering commitment to combating threats and maintaining a regional stability despite the ongoing border conflict, thus taking advantage of a recent rebellion, which may present a weakness in Russian operations. On June 23, 2023, the Wagner Group, a Russian government-funded paramilitary and private military company, staged a rebellion following escalating tensions between the Russian Ministry of Defense and Wagner's leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin. The nation was shocked by this mutiny, which left both Russians and the Kremlin at odds. The rebellion emerged in response to the Ministry of Defense's decision to integrate Wagner forces into the regular military by requiring them to sign contracts before July 1st, thereby diminishing Prigozhin's influence. Refusing to sign the agreement, 
Prigozhin accused the Ministry of Defense of incompetence. The rebellion prompted a criminal case against Prigozhin for inciting armed mutiny against the state. Advancing to within less than 125 miles from Moscow before retreating, the Wagner Group's actions sent shockwaves throughout the nation. The mutiny, premeditated and kept secret from many Wagner members, raised questions regarding the stability of Vladimir Putin's regime and concerns about the group's future as an independent fighting force in Ukraine and other conflict zones. Western commentators have interpreted the recent attempted mutiny within the Wagner Group as evidence of the weakened and ineffective state of Russia. While the mutiny was relatively bloodless, it posed serious doubts about the stability of Putin's regime and the effectiveness of the state's response. The internal unrest within Russia carries implications for the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. It's apparent in recent footage of Prigozhin prior to his alleged death that he felt that the forces engaged with Ukraine in the disputed territory are unequipped and sent to death. His rebellion came after a call for more support for his soldiers, as well as a denial of sending Wagner forces to the front lines to die. This further reflects the bloodiness of the current war, which is ongoing, but also exemplifies why Russia has allowed the growth of Wagner to begin with. Reports on current losses in the Ukraine-Russian war vary among different sources. According to a report from Minas Rus, the approximate assessment of the armed forces of Ukraine as of November 15, 2023, indicates total personnel losses of around 320,670, with approximately 850 wounded. The same report suggests that Russia's losses as of November 15, 2023, amount to approximately 314,290 personnel. These figures are subject to change as the conflict continues. Another source, The Loop, ECPR, estimates that Russian losses have surpassed Ukrainian losses, with projected figures of 76,687 for Russia and 17,222 for Ukraine as of February 23, 2023. However, obtaining precise loss numbers is notoriously difficult, and the fog of war and biases in reporting sources can impact the accuracy of these estimates. In a recent report by Newsweek, Ukraine claimed that Russia has lost 3,700 more troops than the 13,700 soldiers reported by Moscow as lost by Kyiv in November 2023. The General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine reported that Russia has lost a total of 319,820 troops since the war began on February 24, 2022, including 17,400 Russian soldiers allegedly killed in November 2023. These figures reflect the significant toll that the conflict has taken on both sides. Overall, it's evident that the conflict has inflicted heavy losses on both Ukraine and Russia. This is why, over the past two to three years, the group has pursued an operational strategy of expanding its military and economic presence in Africa. Wagner's operational strategy over the past two to three years has been to expand both its military and economic footprint in Africa with a network of associated companies pursuing commercial activities in the countries in which the mercenary group operates. The group has been involved in training, protection of officials, and mining operations in Sudan, and its interest in Mali may be linked to the country's rich gold reserves. Wagner has been incredibly useful for the Russian state in Africa, especially as it seeks diplomatic support amid the Ukraine conflict. The Wagner group has become a very useful tool of Russian foreign policy in Africa, gaining significant influence with limited costs. The group has continued its operations in Africa despite the turbulence faced by its comrades in Russia, and it's been involved in atrocities and human rights abuses in countries such as Libya and Mali. Wagner's presence and activities in Africa have raised concerns about the group's impact on the continent and its relationship with the Russian government. The internal turmoil within the Wagner group and its potential impact on Russia's military and political strategies present opportunities for Ukraine to exploit the unrest within Russia. The recent discussions within the Russian information space regarding operational changes in response to challenges in Ukraine suggest a possible shift in Russia's approach to the conflict, which Ukraine could seek to leverage. The internal challenges faced by the Russian state provide Ukraine with an opportunity to capitalize on the situation and potentially gain an advantage in the ongoing conflict. The Ukrainian military and partisans actively encourage pursuing the conflict, with military intelligence carrying out targeted assassinations of prominent officials from the self-proclaimed Luhansk People's Republic LNR, accused of committing war crimes in occupied Ukraine. Ukrainian mill bloggers express their commitment to a protracted war against Russia and emphasize the necessity for Russia to mobilize its military capabilities and economy for a sustained effort in Ukraine. 
discussions within the Russian information space about operational changes to overcome challenges in Ukraine indicate a potential shift in Russia's approach to the conflict. Reflecting on this dedication, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky remarked in June during a brief coup attempt against the seemingly unassailable Kremlin, Russia's weakness is evident, a complete and growing weakness. The longer Russia keeps its troops and mercenaries on our land, the more chaos, pain and problems it will face later, it's obvious. This statement highlights the ongoing efforts to counteract the influence of various Russian power entities, including a private military group taking advantage of internal strife. The Wagner Group's activities in Africa raise concerns about its impact on the continent and its relationship with the Russian government. Despite the internal unrest, the group continues its operations in Africa to this day, drawing international attention and holding implications for the conflict in Ukraine. The presence of African individuals fighting for the Wagner Group in Ukraine underscores the group's global reach and complex ties to various regions, including Africa. The reported involvement of African individuals fighting for the Wagner Group in Ukraine highlights the group's global reach and engagement with diverse backgrounds. Concerns are raised about the group's impact on Africa and its relationship with the Russian government. In response, the United States has begun sharing more information about Wagner activity in Africa in order to combat their efforts. One US official quipped about the action by Biden's administration, the best way to fight Wagner is with truth. But what do you think? Will the ongoing conflict in Ukraine and the Wagner Group's operations in Africa have implications for regional and global security? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.